This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gold. Hey guys, welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. I am your host. Like, like the gentleman said, I am Steve Gould. Thank you. Thank you for being here. This is uh, episode 87, folks. The big 87. Right off the top, I want to jump right in to thank the donors. Let me get their names up there. There it is. Let me uh, thank the donors and let me put on sexy donor music. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. I want to thank... Corey Payne, Jacob Ruth, Rich Emery, William James Long from William James Long Investigations, Samantha Harper, the great Gary Steiner, Richard Wilson, Scott O'Donnell, David Diaz, Timothy Wright. Thank you all so much. You keep the lights on. You keep the boat afloat. uh, And I'm not going to pull punches here. I love you. I am in love with you. So thank you for that. Totally appreciate it. Today's episode very, very excited for this. Um, been waiting a long time, long time to get an Irish policeman on this podcast. I've put the feelers out. I've requested, I've asked, I've mentioned, I've hinted that that would be so fun and great, especially because I look like a giant leprechaun, have Irish heritage. Um, so I'd like to have one of, one of my blo- brethren on here to uh, see what's happening over there. We've had, we've talked to... Um, I think it was a Scottish Ginny. She was English, but Scottish, right, or something, police? Ah, oh, geez, it's embarrassing. I don't remember what they call it. I'm sure our guest, Sean, can um, correct me. And then we've also had a German gentleman on. And, of course, the um, the special constable from England. So, the hugely popular episodes. And I'm just so excited to have Sean on here. He is, uh, like I said, Irish police officer. Been on a job 13 years. Two of the last, those, his last two years, he's been in the armed support unit, which is very cool. So I uh, can't wait to hear about that. I want to hear about differences in training, academy. I want to get his stories. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be a hot one, I have a feeling. So let me, let me get to brass tacks here. Let's, let's bring Sean on. Sean, welcome to the podcast, sir. Steve, thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Delighted my to be here. Excellent. Delighted to be here. So you've heard, you've heard some of the shows before. I have. I've been listening intently. They're great. Excellent. Really, really interesting. Really interesting to hear so many different uh, cops talk about their lived experiences because, you know, t- cops like to talk shop. So I now have a way to talk shop with police from lots of different places. So it's great. Oh, that's great Just listen man. to them, you know. You know I love, love to hear that. I, lo- I mean, people yeah. love to hear a police officer tell their tales too. Like when I was thinking about the podcast and I asked my non- cop friends they were like a thousand times yes they even just like you know when you go to a party and a cop starts, starts talking people want to hear yeah. they, they want to uh, to look at here behind the curtain what's going on yeah it, it's because you you deal with things that people um and it's the same in any kind of emergency service really uh you deal with things that aren't uh that are really a bit outside of the normal i think you've you, you you've talked about this before that you deal with how many adrenaline inducing incidents as a police officer compared to what a normal person might have happened to them three or four times in their life. We do it hundreds of hundreds of times. Yeah, absolutely. I actually just had a, had a death where I work and I actually had that very thought. I was like, geez, in my almost 15 years, I was like, I wonder how many dead bodies I've dealt with. I can't even remember. And then Mm. I'm thinking a normal person would like see their maybe one person or maybe go to a, a wake or something but yeah a funeral f- home or something forget, yeah. forget about seeing the human body in all kinds of horrible mm. contorted ways that's not gonna happen then you know then it worries me i'm like jesus probably internalizing all this stuff's gonna screw me up later in life but you know it, it is a thing you don't know how that's going to affect you until you see it and some people in, in fairness some people see it and say this isn't for me and they mm. leave which is probably a good idea you know you, you yeah. either can deal with that kind of stuff or you can't and even if you are good at dealing with it, it sometimes i'll probably get into this later it's, it's a good thing to talk about it because you know yeah you can't uh, if you internalize all that stuff it's not good yeah no you're absolutely right and i almost i almost was one of those people i was like, on the fence when i saw early on saw a couple of things that were like Oh, I never seen that in real life. And then, um, kind of had that moment where you, 
do I want to keep doing this? And then thankfully I kind of grew those calluses and I, cause I absolutely love police work and that was going to be something that made me go, eh, I don't know if I want to want to keep being exposed to that. But so yeah, people out there, you know, yeah. you can, you can definitely, I mean, I used to work with, I told this story before I used to work with a fire captain. Um, I'd see him on call sometimes and they played the birth video at the EMT class in like the eighties mm. and he passed out and uh, yeah. he was like, he tried to quit. And the instructor was like, what are you doing? And he's like, I got to quit. I, mean, I can't do this. And he's like, that's not, that's not necessarily true. You've probably just had a life where you've not yeah. seen that. So just give yourself yeah, a little. a good thing, you know. Yeah, you, give yourself a little. a good job, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, You're not yeah. seeing ladies give birth left and right. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, well, you know, not there's anything wrong. It's a completely natural thing. But, you know, sometimes your parents can do too good a job and you're completely kept away from all this kind of stuff. And then you, you go on one of these jobs and you see it and you, you know, it's an eye opener. Oh yeah. We, we used to do that all the time. And when I worked for backgrounds at LAPD, you get a great candidate that was squeaky clean. And then, but they've been in their mother's basement and they're like 28 yeah, years old. Yeah, and it's like, yeah. they never supported themselves. They never done anything. They never even been in a scuffle. You know, they just never like, I don't know what this person's going to be able to, that, to, yeah, to but do. you see, those people can can um, surprise you sometimes. Yeah, but you're you're right. Uh, like you can't substitute life experience, and uh, it is a thing. I, th- I think if you're if you, you know we can talk about it later. But if you're if you're thinking about becoming a police officer, you really need to do get yourself out there and see what how will you react the first time someone punches you in the face. You know, <laughs> that yeah. kind of that kind of thing. Yeah, because everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah. I love that you know, quote. That's uh, great. Yeah. Um, yeah so Sean, do. I'm, I'm super curious about our, the differences. Most of the listeners are either on the job or they're, they're going to be on the job or they, they know a lot, they have a lot of knowledge about American police. Um, yeah. But with the Irish police, it's obviously different. It's a national force, which is different, you know, in America, I don't know if you guys think it's odd, but like here, like state, county, yeah. town, city, yeah. village, you could have seven layers of police all depending on the mind yeah, yeah like they, just because I, uh, yeah sorry go ahead is sorry. it just because they're the village has an option to have a police force the town the city the state like mm. they if they want to use their tax base for that they can have mm. it so it's kind of it, weird it does it is boggling to me as someone like ireland is in a very <laughs> Unitary, I think they call it. It's very um, centralized because it's a small country. We're the size of a medium-sized state. I, right. I, I, I should probably explain that for people because I know I've been to the US and Canada a bit, and I, and, and we're only a small country in the in the big uh, scheme of things. Well, I know there's only thirty of, people uh, in Canada, so. Well, that's it. Yeah, but <laughs> if there's only thirty people in Canada, there's only three here. <laughs> you know, um, and a lot of people in. North America have Irish ancestry or heritage, so they might know of it as an island on the western edge of Europe. But to explain, Ireland as an island is divided into 32 counties, and uh, 26 of those are the Republic of Ar- Ireland, is what it's called in our constitution, but that's some people call it the Republic of Ireland, and six are part of Northern Ireland. Uh, Northern Ireland is... yeah. One, so the northeast of the country, there are six counties, about two million people, and they are part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. That's where the troubles happened in the 60s, 70s, 80s, right. 90s. Um, you know, the, the, all the, the troubles that you hear about. Um, the other 26 counties are the Republic of Ireland. That's uh, where I live and work. Uh, so we are an independent country with our own president, prime minister, parliament, national police force, army, all that kind of stuff. And we're part of the EU, whereas Northern Ireland is now no longer part of the EU. And that's causing trouble because, you know, this Brexit thing, I don't know if you've heard much about Brexit in the US, yeah. but the UK, because the UK is like a federal state. There's, it's a country of countries. So there's four countries in the UK, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And inside of those, they've got three legal jurisdictions. England and Wales is one, Scotland is one, and uh, Northern Ireland is one. Oh boy! And I'm not a smart man. Yeah, yeah, it's very confusing. Yeah, it's very complicated. Uh, but we have it a lot simpler over here. On the island of Ireland, there are two police forces, Ungarda Shikana, uh, who are the police of the Republic of Ireland, and the Police Service of Northern Ireland, who are the Police Service of Northern Ireland. Okay. Um, 
the police service of Northern Ireland are routinely armed um, because of the stuff that's happened in Northern Ireland over the years. Mm. And then uh, on Garda Shikana is not. And they are the only police force in the UK in that you know, the UK, that those four countries that form the UK, they're the only police force that's routinely armed, the police service in Northern Ireland. Hmm. So um, we, we, we have, you know, we're both, so this basically this island has two countries on it, uh, two different police forces. And I work for the larger one. Uh, the, the Republic of Ireland has a, a population of uh, 5 million, I think now. And, uh, we have a centralised national police force on Garda Shikana, which is Irish for, uh, I remember you had, you had an English guest on uh, a few years ago and he was a special constable with the British Transport Police. I think. Right. Uh, Britain is a little bit more like America that way in that Scotland has one police force, but England and Wales have 40 some um, police forces. Uh, Northern Ireland has one police force then as well. But he, uh, the British Transport Police is a special one. They just do the, like the trains and the transit routes and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, but I, I, he, he was talking about Garda Shikana, but he, he did, in fairness, he tried to pronounce the word, but it's 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 Irish or as American would say Gaelic. So it's if you don't speak the language, it's a very hard. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it, it's a thousand year old, a couple of thousand year old Celtic language. If you don't know how to speak it, it's very hard to say words like on Garda Shikana. Yeah. You know, um, but uh, that. Uh, that we are the, as I said, the national police and security service of the Republic of Ireland. Okay. So we, um, as I said, it's a, an unarmed police force. It was founded in 1922. So it's our hundred hundred year anniversary next year. Um, because Ireland became independent in 1922 as part of the politics between us and Britain. We had a war of independence between 1919 and 1922, then a civil war, uh, for one year. And then, uh, we are, that's how that that is the, the the birth story of the Republic of Ireland because I don't think uh, with us being such a small country a lot of people come here on vacation and they don't necessarily understand you know the difference between Northern Ireland and the Republic and there's an open border between the two um, that was made easier because we were both part of the EU and there was a peace agreement that, that ended kind of the troubles in the north but that's causing an issue now because obviously the UK has left. The EU, the EU, which means you might have to, ha- it's the only land border the UK shares with the rest of the EU. So part of the peace agreement is that there's unfettered movement between the border. And I don't want to get into politics now or anything like that, but it is going to, it's going to cause difficulties, you know? Yeah, I totally understand. But, uh, are they the Protestants or are they the Catholic? Well, you see, uh, both, uh, both religions would live up. You see, that's a, if you were going to simplify it, you'd say, yeah, Northern Ireland Protestant, the Republic Catholic, but that's not, it's not as simple as that. I, like Protestants live in the Republic and there's right. a large Catholic minority in Northern Ireland and uh, religion isn't very important in the Republic anymore, really. Um, it's not a thing. Um, that Ireland, I think people look at it and they think of this really staunchly Catholic country, that kind of thing. It's not really that way anymore. Uh, yeah. We're a real modern European country in most ways, you know, like any other, um, except we speak English, which uh, a lot of Americans like, a lot of American companies like, a lot of American companies in Ireland now. Yeah. My, Intel, Facebook, Microsoft. My wife Apple. went to visit her extended family there a couple of years back and um, their whole family went. And they're, they have a, another cousin, not, not the one in the Garda, but another one that works for Intel or somebody. And he makes, Intel, yeah, he and makes a conduit huge. for them. And he's yeah, like, it's a huge factory. yeah, like a driver picked them up at the airport and brought them to his house mm-hmm. in Ireland. And he has this huge house and um, he's really, really, his career took off because of Intel, you know, and I guess there's. Mm. Um, we have a lot of American pharmaceutical companies in that here too, like Pfizer and these oh, kind of bad. things. Yeah. Well, you know, we, the, we kind of, I suppose because we're an English speaking country and we're in the EU that tends to attract a lot of um, American business and stuff over here. Yeah. But uh, anyway, get, getting back to the, the policing side of things. Uh, yeah. We're, it was when the Gardaí were initially founded in we were an armed force, um, but stuff happened uh, around the civil war that was occurring at the time. The civil war occurred because there was a, kind of a disagreement over the a treaty ended the war of independence with Britain, and that basically, you know, 
that didn't necessarily divide the country, but the country was divided as a result um, uh, of that because obviously there was a, a majority at the time of people in Northern Ireland who wanted to maintain, become, stay part of Britain. And anyway, there was a civil war here and uh, we were initially an armed force because the force that was replaced, the Royal Irish Constabulary, um, had been armed too. But a decision was made about a year in to uh, disarm the force and it kind of continued in that vein. So now, obviously, when you say an unarmed police, no police force is completely unarmed. You have right. always had uh, people, uh, the ability to have armed officers or whatever, of that kind of a way. But uh, in general, if you meet a police officer here in Ireland, if you came over here in the morning on holiday, Steve, or on vacation, sorry, um, and the first police officer you'd see would not be carrying a firearm. And most police officers you would meet, if you met any, would not be or patrolling and driving around doing their daily duties. Really? That's, um, but it's not an armed public either, though, right? Largely? No. Well, uh, hunting and stuff is allowed. Hunting, or hunting shotguns, uh, your two two rifles. There are things like pistol clubs and that, but it's mostly two two pistol shooting. There isn't, there isn't, um, uh, I think it's to do with our history. Um, there isn't a there uh, guns are things that are kind of associated with hunters and farmers right and uh, outside of that there wouldn't be a huge gun enthusiast community um, some people are involved in you know pistol shooting olympic pistol shooting things like that but there wouldn't be um uh, the, the the history like uh, you know the US has a history with gun ownership and uh, it's right. a part of the tradition over there that, that that really isn't here um because of the way the country was founded um, here. Um, you know, the American Revolution was in 1775 to 1783. Right. Ours was only 100 years ago. So uh, th- things are kind of different. We, we are generally an unarmed public, but um, people uh, should understand we are a modern country. We have drug gangs. We have. Oh, I'm sure uh, you I remember have it all. I mean, yeah, we, I met an American tourist uh, here years ago. I was on vacation uh, in the west of Ireland, and I met an American tourist, and uh, she was quite uh, she was a lovely lady, uh, but I don't think she kind of understood that all those types of crimes could happen here the well, same well, as they do in the US. Vacation. She's on vacation. Yeah, yeah, but you know, <laughs> the, we had heroin addicts, and sure. we have crack cocaine, and we have crime, and all those kind of things that any other place has. Um, you know, I think some people think it's a idyllic and it is in a lot of ways. It is, it's a beautiful country. I love my country, but um, we do have crime and that's why we have a police force. Thankfully. So I have a job. Yeah. Yeah. Job <laughs> you know? security. But um, the, uh, anyway, the, the police force, as I said, uh, standard on armed, we have a very big ethos um, around kind of community policing. Uh, even before that was a thing. It really is a thing in, in the Gardaí now, um, but it always has been a really community-orientated police force, um, policing by consent. Um, probably modelled a lot after uh, the British police forces that way, unarmed, policing by consent, community model, that kind of thing. Yeah, those are very um, um, very effective. They, we, there was just a study over here that rated Massachusetts really high for mm. um, policing in, in violent encounters with our public. And not because there's no crime, because there's plenty of crime, but because of, um, like I was saying before, Massachusetts is one of those states that has every town broken down into its own little fiefdom. So every town has its own yes. services. Well, that forces the town or the, the local police forces really do get to know the local people because they're yeah. they're in that community. And that tr- really does translate into when violent encounters come around to a police department that just knows the people that much better. And, yeah, it it does. You know. I, I spent most of my service before I was doing what I do now. Um, I was in a uh, rural, a medium-sized town. That that's where I was, and I got to know the people there. I was there for over a decade, and you get to know the people. You get to know the criminals. You get to know the everyday people. The everyday people who commit crimes sometimes. The you know, and, flyers. Yeah. Yeah, and the people that are just everyday normal people that sometimes commit crime. Yeah, that happens, you know. I think you said it before, and I thought it was a really good quote, that um, as a police officer, you very rarely meet very many evil people, and you remember those people you do meet who are evil. You'll, you'll meet normal people who do evil things. Right. Because that's what most 
crime is. We're not, none of us are perfect, I don't think. Um, right. Somebody just screwed none up. None of us are saying. Yeah, it's, people screw up. And I think if you approach people like that as a person and realize that they've screwed up, you can, you're a more effective cop. Yeah, absolutely. I think personally, um, don't don't come to it judging people. It's not not a not a good way to go. Yeah, yeah, especially if you're if you're not putting the mirror on yourself. You know, I got I got too many of my yeah. own problems. <laughs> so yeah, exactly, where none of us are perfect. Sean, say say you're in Ireland and you want to be Garda, you want to be a police officer. Um, what's the process like? What's the what's the schooling? What's the academy? What's the, how do you get get okay. to it? So. Uh, it's changed a bit now, um, the academy. Uh, particularly COVID has changed at a huge amount. But um, ours too. When I joined, yeah, it's it's really it's become distance learning, a lot more learning in the station now and stuff like that. You'd see um, we have a lot of students in the station. And people and are already busting Gary. these guys with chops getting on the road. They're like, oh, you went to a COVID academy, not even a real academy. Yeah, it's like, cops I know. Will, it's they hard won't, it's <laughs> cops won't miss any opportunity to make another no. cop feel bad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially, you know, you're you're not. Um, I, I find I don't know about over there, but over here, definitely, there's like a ten year sweet spot that if you haven't hit that, you're still just new. You know, yeah. you, you haven't seen everything yet, and you don't. You know, that that you're. I don't. Uh, that's the thing, actually. Um, I don't know. Our career is kind of around the thirty year mark to get your pension. Yep. I know in some places in the US it's twenty. I think the LAPD is twenty. Is it? I think some are twenty, yeah, twenty five. Ours is thirty. Yeah, so 30. So, uh, you know, until you have a, thir- a good solid third done, you're not, um, that's a very hard word for Irish people to say, actually, a third. <laughs> you did it well. 30 third. But, uh, yeah, third. No, uh, uh, my mother spent a long time when I was younger trying to make sure I pronounced my THs. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, our academy, sorry, I digress again. Our academy is, um, so it, the whole process for me to join took the bones of a year, probably, um, between, uh, we have a thing called the public appointments, public appointment service here. They advertise for all civil service and public service jobs. And uh, you apply um, through those, them. And then you, the, there's a multi-stage kind of test. You do these aptitude tests, you know, ver- verbal and uh, verbal yep. reasoning and um, numerical reasoning, stuff like that. That's pretty standard for all civil service jobs here. And uh, then you... Um, well, you progress to the interview stage. And if you pass that, you progress to a medical and then a physical test. And if you pass all those, you get a date to go to the academy, which is called the Garda Shikana College. It's called a college because you get a, an associate's level degree at the end of your training. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it is. It is because it gives a kind of a, I don't know about it. I, I was explain a bit more about this in a sec, but um how we prosecute cases. Um, I suppose I should explain that we are a common law country, just like uh, the US. So adversarial court system, uh, you have judges and we have a two tiered um, legal profession. We have solicitors and barristers where they're they're combined to just lawyers. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Depending on, they don't have to, but a lot of them still want to. So outer wigs and gowns. um, That's a hangover from, yeah, what they're doing it's 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 pantomime, it's theater. It's uh, to do with uh, the, the, you know it really is um, uh, particularly with barristers and the powdered wigs and the gowns and everything. It's uh, very intimidating for victims and stuff like that. I knew police officers because we, we prosecute our own cases in the lower courts in the district court. So oh, we have really? a version of a, yeah. You yeah. have like a police so prosecutor, or does each officer do it? Uh, you see, you have a, what's called a court presenter, and in the country, we call it outside of Dublin, um, you have a guard inspector, which would be a lieutenant rank, um, who uh, kind of gets up and leads. He, he, he can't be led. You can't be led in your evidence or anything like that, but he kind of manages it. Damn, um, that's, he, you got to like, yeah. you got to want to do that. Yeah. That's a and, uh, Yeah, uh, but you have to go up and give your own evidence. You're, you are, you complete the file um, it's a great way to build experience. Um, I bet. Uh, you, you complete the file yourself completely. Um, you send it to, uh, if it's a minor thing, the DPP, we have a DPP, a director of public prosecutions, which would be like a DA, I suppose in America. Okay. We don't, and he had, it's actually she at the moment, um, has different offices, state solicitors around the country. And if it's a serious crime, the file goes to them and they say, yay, nay, prosecute them for this charge, that charge, whatever. Um, but if, uh, 
if it's a minor enough kind of a thing and it's minor assault, uh, road traffic stuff, you know, like uh, intoxicated drivers, all that kind of thing, you're, you're, you're prosecuting that yourself. You create the file yourself, you prosecute it yourself. You give all the evidence, you organize the witnesses, you, wow, that's pretty um, neat. it's a great way to learn. Yeah. Um, but it's a lot of pressure on junior officers. So I think that's probably something to do with why they wanted you to have kind of a, some kind of education coming into it, you know, because yeah. you're, you're up there with these guys. It takes years to become a legal professional, but you're up against them and uh, you have to learn how to do it. I like, I like, I've always liked court. I've liked it, it is, but it is theater, you know, court. Yeah. Our system is different in mainland Europe where it's kind of an inquisitorial system where the judge is actually asking questions as opposed to just being the referee of this thing that's going on, you know, yeah. but, um, Anyway, sorry, uh, I had to digress. I go back to the college. You start there, it's two years. It's kind of paramilitary, which is strange for an unarmed force, I suppose, but we do square bashing, marching, uh, have inspections every morning. I think that's good. I think um, that, that's good. Yeah, I, I, I do. I think it's good. I, I actually, um, I was an army reservist uh, here before I joined the, which would be like National Guard, I suppose, whatever you want to call it, when I was in college, before I joined the um, police, uh, the Guardy, and um that really stood to me then, you know, that wasn't, I was expecting more of that, but there was less than what I was expecting. Oh yeah, because for you, I, had you were, had more. I had guys who were Marines and army guys in my police academy and to them, yeah. police academy was like, this is great. Yeah. They were show, no, helping I, you know, us I, after academy. Like, no, you got to march like this, you know, kind of leading us. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that's what we had. The, the guys with prior military experience. Cause <clears throat> now I would say an army reservist in Ireland is not a Marine. <laughs> you know, it's not, oh, okay. it's not, it's, it, it was, it was, you know, it was like, National Guard. Gotcha. But, yeah, really. You know, it was enjoyable, really enjoyable. I mean, you were 17, and if you were into that kind of thing, here's an assault rifle. Here's a yeah, yeah. general general purpose machine like, gun. Bring it on. You, know, you know, you were trained properly, and you were trained to march, and you were trained to use the firearms, and you were given responsibility. And I think that was a great thing, actually. It really stood to me in my interview um, when I was going for the the – police because it showed you had some life experience of a discipline kind of a thing and all that. I, I think it's important too because it 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 makes a bonding experience for you and your fellow classmates that when you mm. get on the force, you know everybody that you work with has been through that. And it's kind of something yeah. you can bond over. That's why I always get yeah. a little bit and you know I only know what I know where I where I'm from, but when I hear other countries that do this completely informal like college setting where there's no there's really no pressure except for the the tests and stuff, there's no marching mm-hmm. and there's no to me it doesn't it, it I don't think you would get the same result for for me, making people gel, you know. I agree, and I understand why people. I think your German guest was talking about this. It was very college orientated where he was, and mm. I, I I agree with you. I think. Uh, you're you're not trying to make people into robots, but you want to have that um, communal learning experience of that square bashing, that marching around, that saluting senior officers in the corridor, that you know, right. getting your uniform right, getting your hairline right, getting being shaved, and getting inspected in the morning and stuff like that. There's something to that, I think. I think, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, I think there's just something to it. But I, I, the whole process of us training back when I did it, there was five phases. It's different now, uh, and I'm not sure exactly. I think it's they've rejigged it, but it's still similar in that you do your first phase was in the college. It was six months, so it was all book learning, marching, uh, police self defense, which is you know defensive tactics stuff like that, swimming, first aid, um, law, contextual policing studies, practices and procedures, um, all that kind of stuff. And so after that was over. Uh, you went out into an active station for six months, but you were not, you were in uniform. You had blue epaulets that marked you out as a student, but you were not an attested police officer. Okay. You were supernumerary. You were to shadow, you were to help, you were to walk around and learn. I thought those were some of the best six months training I had because there's not, nothing is expected of you. Yes. You had uh, reports and projects and stuff like that you had to do, but you were there to learn and you couldn't be given a caseload. Right. Which once you get your badge and you become an attested police officer and the, you know, you get all that stuff, you are going to attract a caseload because there's too much happening for you not to, you know, and people are going to expect you to carry the load. Whereas if you're just there to help and learn 
it was a great time uh, i thought yeah it um, sounds like a good system yeah and then you go you went back to the college for another i think it was three or four months and did more book learning and stuff like that um and then you were tested which meant you got your badge your powers you are now a police officer and then you went back out in the road for eight or nine months different and then color went, applets just, no your numbers so oh, numbers, numbers mean you're now a police officer that you, oh, you have your okay. your district numbers so or your divisional numbers so the the way our numbers work on your shoulder uh, i'm sure you've seen that in english police officers too uh, your division is the top two letters so um KY would be Kerry division. Um, and then your number is that identifies you. That's the thing where the force is organized. The Gardish Khan is organized into regions, divisions, and districts. And um, so over us all, we have a commissioner, two deputy commissioners. Um, I think there's like six assistant commissioners. Uh, and then the assistant commissioners each have a region. The region is consisted of divisions, which have a chief superintendent which in a, the US, I know it depend, I know the force depends and the rank depends on the force, but it'll be the rank above a captain. Some places it's a major, some places it's a colonel, some places it's mm. a superintendent. But the chief superintendent um, oversees a number of districts that are commanded by superintendents who would equivalent who would be the equivalent of a captain in US police forces um, or a chief in a smaller police force. Um, and then you have inspectors who would be like lieutenants under him and then sergeants and then guardy. So like if you say you're out, say there's um, a, like a town in the country that's like small, like 5,000 people. Um, yeah. Would it have a little police department with like um, a captain would be like the head guy? Uh, no, it would have uh, probably an inspector. So like lieutenant. Okay. And a captain say would be in a bigger town. So the superintendent would be in a bigger town and that would be the district and that district would have a number of these small or medium-sized towns in it. And the way in general nowadays, we're moving to a different model of policing. There's a lot of reform going on at the moment, but what they want is an inspector in each one of those towns and then you'd have a number of sergeants. And they uh, each have their own lockup and all that? Yeah, they, yes, which uh, always uh, was a, interesting because... The town where I worked, we had cells, as we called them, and uh, you had a station with cells. It was called it was called a, a barracks, Scarda Barracks, oh, yeah, because like that the stadies, was a ho- stadies around here. Yeah, it was, that was a holdover from uh, the Royal Irish Constabulary, which is much more paramilitary force. And like one of the station I worked in for a long time was actually a Royal Irish Constabulary station. It was 150 years old. They used to sleep there. Uh, they used to sleep there, and Gardy yeah. used to sleep in their stations. That's just you like the Mass to- State Police, same thing. Yeah, yeah. You had to sleep. Uh, they got rid of that probably in the eighties, but you, when you were new, you had to stay in. The, you had to live in the station. Imagine, so weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it, it, yeah, it really must have been for those guys back then and, and girls back then too. Um, but uh, so you go out in this phase four, it was called. Uh, that's where you have powers, and you now you're a proper police officer for the first time, but you're on probation. And uh, your your probation lasts two years, so it overlaps your training by a full year after your training is finished. Um, Damn, that's a long time. And then, yeah, it's a two year probation. It's a two year training cycle, and a two year probation once you're ex- once you're attested. So you're actually on after you finish your training cycle. So sorry, when you finish that phase four, you go back to the college again for like four weeks for phase five, and they just that's called capstone training. They just do a few lectures and different things. But most of uh, you train for your mark for your passing out because we very intricate passing out grade. It's brass band. The Gardaí have a full time brass band, so we have brass band playing. You no kidding, that's awesome. And out of each other and around in circles and all that kind of stuff. It's really cool. It's it, got to be a piper in there, it. right? It's, no, no piper. Are you kidding? Actually, uh, <laughs> it's no, like an American Irish piper. thing. <laughs> um, the piper, the pipe bands are really. There are lots of pipe bands in Ireland, but piping is a Scottish thing, right. really. It kind of came over to Ireland in the late 1800s, but uh, Irish Americans really got into piping and kilts and stuff like that. That's Scottish. Yeah, <laughs> true. It's so true. You know, and I love, I, I, now I love pipe bands. I do. I actually mm. love pipe bands. And I was uh, an army reservist. We used to march in the St. Patrick's Day Parade over here and uh, get behind a pipe band. And they're oh, playing. It's great. Like, you know, no, you can really my, march with that music. Yeah, my buddy's a piper for, um, um, 
oh, he's going to kill me. I can't remember the name right now, but he, they, they've opened a bunch of times for dropkick Murphys and stuff. My buddy, yeah, yeah, yeah. he just retired yeah, from the Coast yeah. Guard and he plays, um, we were living together, believe it or not, um, 15 years ago. He was renting a room in a house, in my house, and he was learning how to play the bagpipe and I wanted to kill him. Oh my God. He had yeah, that yeah, little yeah, trainer, that, that like the little like, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not a real bagpipe, Breathe. it's just, yes. Yeah. And he was doing yeah. it on my back on our deck and I'm like, dude, we're going to get kicked out of the neighborhood. You got to shut that thing up. Yeah, yeah. But now he's, but now it's see- awesome. Yeah, it is. It, it, and the Irish Army has pipe bands. The Gardaí don't. We have a brass band for whatever reason. That's I don't know cool. why. But those guys, they, those guys are full time. That's what they do all the time. They are a, they are attested Gardaí. They have uniforms and all that kind of stuff. But their full time job is that. Now over COVID, they were actually sent out on the road. Ooh, which was interesting harsh. for them, I'm sure. <laughs> they were like, this yeah. sucks. Oh, it was, in fact, we did an all hands to the wheel kind of a thing, you know? So, but we, 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 you pass out then after your two years training and, uh, you still have a year's probation after that. And if you pass that, you're, you know, fully fledged police officer. So the whole training period is two years with an extra year of probation after the fact. They're starting to do that here. Um, like, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've looked into it and read about every state has different, <laughs> different yeah. standards it's crazy and we're trying to we're trying to become more standardized but um in massachusetts now there are a few colleges uh state colleges that have a four-year program where you do four yeah. years you get a bachelor of science in criminal justice and you also graduate academy certified so throughout That's good. when you're getting your four-year degree you are also I think it might be during the summer or weekends or something you're attending police academy. So, mm. cause in, in the States, the, the closest thing we get to what you you're talking about is like, we'll have a lot of departments where places that can afford it. Um, like smaller, more affluent places, not like big cities. They just need too many numbers, but smaller places that can afford it. They will like my the agency on the Cape I work for, you had to have a four year degree to work there period. Okay. So that was just a local thing. They decided that they just decided locally and which is hard. It makes your, your pool smaller, but, um, so we would have a four year degree. It could be in anything though. It doesn't have to be law enforcement. It could be in computers. And then you, then we send you to the police Academy, which is, you know, I think 22 weeks now. So they kind of backload it. They kind of, you have Mm. your degree. They make sure you're, you know, learned. And then they send you to the police Academy where they shout at you and, so, yeah. but none of it, it none of it's standardized. It's all kind of. No, I, I do feel I, I know um, one of your former guests, Steve Marielli. I listened to his podcast, and he has a big thing that in the US, like you can have a, an academy that's twelve weeks in some states, and yeah. then it could be thirty weeks in other states. And he high said, high school What's diploma, missing? twelve weeks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What's missing in the yeah. intervening weeks between the twelve and the, and the twelve and the thirty? Um, uh, yeah, I, I do like the fact that we see we are smaller. No, we're uh, smaller. We we are smaller than the NYPD, but we still have nearly fourteen thousand officers. Um, you know, because it's a national police force. Sure. We I think that they're heading for. They want to get to twenty one thousand employees, so fifteen thousand officers, and that's great. Um, then guard of staff, they call it, not civilians, because we're all civilians technically, because we're not in the military. But you know that that, yeah. that there'll be twenty one thousand employees. Um. So fifteen thousand sworn or attested and six thousand non, um, which is as big as we've never been that big, you know. Uh, but we have a growing population and different types of crime problems, and you need to sure. address that kind of stuff. So you know, it is good working. I don't know, um, it's good working for a big national organization like that because we have all the different types of expertise. I've heard you and some of your guests talking about stuff, you know, like the, the county guys would come and take over a certain case or the state police in your case. Mm-hmm. If there's a, like where I worked, if a murder happened and it did, and I was involved in the investigation team for murder, even though I was what was called a regular unit guard, it was all hands to the wheel and you're, and that, that's great because you get experience dealing with those kind of things. Not, there's no one coming to take it from you because you are, the only police now that you have all these experts that can come in and assist in these various areas, but you're still running yeah. that case or whatever. Massachusetts you know? is pretty, I don't, I've never heard of other States doing it like we do, but because there's so many little, little rural communities with like one, two, three, four guys, they've, the DAs decided years ago that the only people that can process, investigate their own. Well, I shouldn't say that we can still investigate our own homicides, 
but it has to be alongside a state agency. So okay. the state police would be the lead agency. The only cities in the state of Massachusetts that can investigate their own homicides, believe it or not, are like Boston, Worcester, Springfield, and Pittsfield. And there's some there's some cities in there with hundreds of thousands of people that can't do their own murders. Yeah, which is no. we would like, bizarre. Yeah, I, yeah, no, we we would if we had a murder unless it had something. We have like a a national bureau of criminal investigation who you know that's a, a unit in on Garda Chicana that do that. Sure. We have no other agency like the Garda. We do everything from writing tickets to investigating murders to taking cats out of trees you do every, you know we just there right. is no other agency in the middle doing anything else you know which is great and i think it's good but you can't do that in countries the size of the u.s with federalized systems it, that wouldn't Pe- work people people in the u.s and you know the vibe here hate the idea of a federal police force they hate, oh yeah, yeah they hate yeah, it yeah, they, they I, want i, I mean there's states that. like massachusetts doesn't give the fbi peace officer status so when the fbi agents yeah. are here they don't yeah. always have the authority you'd think they would, where a state like Virginia yeah. swears them as a peace officers. Now they're good. So yeah. the states really pull that power in and they're very, uh, a national police force to people here. You know how people can be, you know, they're in, in the states, yeah, I, I know. Yeah, the yeah, rebel yeah. yell, you know, we're not being policed by some yeah, organized yeah. federal government, but yeah. it's like you said, it's, it's way different. There's 300 and 30 million people here across yeah, exactly. 50 states. We, we should try, have, we know. should probably have seven different presidents, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah what's one it, guy it, ruling over our entire country with all these different yeah. cultures? It doesn't even make sense. No, no. But you know, it, 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 in fairness, no matter what people say, I'm always a positive type of person. You, you have made it work for a couple of hundred years. So hey, we're play. still going. <laughs> I might be You're catching a plane to Ireland any day now, but so far so yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's easier to do it in a smaller thing, but it is so much easier. I, like my jurisdiction doesn't end until I cross an international border. That's great. It's awesome. You know, I don't, you know, my, it's not like, uh, oh, I've crossed a state line. Now I can't arrest this person or. Let me ask you this, Sean. Is, is it insulting that in the U.S. for years and years we called the, our, um, like, uh, our riot, like, arrest vans paddy wagons? You know, no, we call them paddy wagons too. Oh, you do? That's we, awesome. We call them paddy wagons as well. Yeah, yeah. And I know, we know the story behind it. Um, you know, paddy wagons because you know Irish and people and fight drinking and, and fighting. The thing is, I think it's a so great many, rep to have. Like, oh, we like to drink yeah, and fight. So many people drink and fight. It, yeah. The English people are just as bad as Australians and Americans. I'm sorry, oh, yeah. just drink and fight a lot. I mean, Canadians, Canadian, everyone oh, thinks yeah. Canadians are yeah, happy. Clapping, they'll buy you, you they'll buy you a beer afterwards. The Canadian, they're very oh, friendly, yeah, yeah, but they'll yeah, knock yeah. your teeth out. What's the name of that uh, hockey is Stanley Cup, is it? That thing. What's oh yeah, that's Stanley Cup for the NHL, yeah. 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 Did you ever like when they lose or win or whatever, they they do things tear the, the cup. city apart. Like, oh oh yeah, yeah, they flip cars they over. The they, yeah. Whether they win or lose, you know. Um we our big sports here are um Soccer, right? G A. No, or well, football. soccer is yeah, yeah soccer uh, is yeah, it is a national sport. But, but the re you know, the thing that people love here is GA, which is Gaelic athletics, so hurling and Irish football. Oh really? Now, I would encourage anyone from the US who doesn't know what those are to Google them. Is it like rugby? Uh, the football, not really. It's a big ball, and you, you play it from your hand. It's called football, but you play it from your hand. But I'm guessing there's a lot of headbutting and punching each other in the face. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but not, but then there's hurling as well, which you play with a stick. It's, it's like a it's it's a cross between what I've heard Americans describe it as like lacrosse. Is, it's a cross between lacrosse. Um, if you added lacrosse to field hockey to baseball, no, not baseball at all. Cause it's played on a pitch, like a, like a, like a, an American football pitch, that kind of thing. Uh, kind of field hockey and lacrosse. If you cross those two, no kidding. Um, wow. it's, a, it's a thousand something year old game. It's thousands of years old. Those are our national sports. We have a massive stadium in Dublin called Croke Park that has an 83,000 seat capacity that we go and watch these things and people don't know about it outside of Ireland uh, but it is there's all sorts of reaction videos on YouTube of people watching these games for the first time and they're like wow what? how are they not kidding oh, I'm, I'm they, Googling they this these. this is awesome yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. but they're, they are great they're so fast um, I, I'm not a big soccer fan but I love those because they're just fast and everything's happening and lots of scoring you know that kind of thing that's cool but um, 
Yeah, but uh, yeah, sorry, I, I've gone on another tangent. No, I, I have a million questions for you, Sean, and they don't. A lot of them don't have to do with police stuff. I just, uh, uh, I think yeah. it's fascinating to hear about mm-hmm. Ireland. Is what is County Mayo like? Is that I heard it was like poor, <laughs> poor pig farmers. Uh, no, it, nowhere in Ireland is. That Ireland, was told to me by my family that's from County oh, Mayo. Yeah. They were like, "Well, we yeah, left there because yeah, it was, yeah. you know, pig farming." Yeah, well, th- yeah, because it was I- Ireland. Um, was historically a, a quite a poor country, it's an agrarian poor country, and that's where my mum's. Uh, um, that's where the, my mum's side of the family's from. Is Mayo. yeah, because you see, if you, if you were depending on agriculture to live, if you went to Mayo, it's beautiful, it's striking, and beautiful, and uh, but there's a lot of rock there. There's not a, a lot of good tillage land. There's not a lot a lot of good grass. Um, that's where the pig and sheep farming thing that you were talking about came from. Um, but it looks beautiful. But if you wanted to farm, not so great. Sounds like Western but, Mass where I am. Not as beautiful, but there's just too much friggin' rock in the soil. It's insane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, um, so so it, my grandfather went over there with my grandmother before they passed away 20 years ago. And he was, mm. his parents had come here and he did, you know, he ended up being in World War II, went to, got to go to BU on the GI Bill and became a principal nice. of the school system. Very successful. But he had first cousins still in Ireland. So they went over there and the whole visit, they had this plan to go. Their last name was um, Degnan. So it was like the Degnan still had a farm and a whole thing. And my grandmother was like, we got to go. We're supposed to go over and meet these people. He waited to the last day. And this is like this old school mentality because he felt like he was being a braggart by going there. Yeah. He felt like, cause he was going to, I don't want to go there and say, Hey, look at me. I'm look at Mr. Fancy with my yeah. with my trip and I live in you know in Boston now and yeah. I'm a principal and my grandmother wanted to choke him. She's like, We're going yeah. to meet these people. And you know, yeah. they were lovely yeah. and they lived in a beautiful house that was like eight hundred years old, you know, like the coolest yeah, yeah, coolest yeah. thing possible. But he almost didn't go because of that weird feeling yeah. between the two degnants. Yeah, well there's a thing, um Ireland in the last I say thirty years, maybe has just economically gone on this massive uptick. We've been, right, killing uh, it, uh, killing uh, it, baby. Uh, yeah, but not always. You know, obviously we have recessions and blah blah blah, whatever. Sure. But Ireland, um, uh, the Ireland, a lot of uh, immigrants probably left in the fifties and stuff is nothing. Um, you know, an earlier and later, even it, it's nothing like the Ireland of today. You know, yeah. like, like we were saying before, there's huge companies like Intel and. Apple and oh, all these. Yeah. I heard, you know, it's, I heard yeah, it's crazy. It's uh, there's a lot of money washing around this country. Now there's still poverty. Like that's the, that's capitalism for you, you know, John, yeah, there's no poverty in Ireland. It's beautiful. It's all green rolling. Yeah, hills. Yeah, exactly. It's all blue and grown. No, it doesn't rain here. No except assaults it rains all the time. or violence. Or yeah, it's yeah. Just, it's just but I, I do. I, I love, I, I love my country. I think it's, I wouldn't live anywhere else. I love traveling. I love going places, yeah. but I would not live anywhere else. I really do. I yeah. love coming home. I, do. Cool. I love it. I got to get over there. My, I'm obviously I have, my family was from there and my wife's been there. It's like, I gotta, I'd love to go over there. It's just, um, well, obviously COVID, oh, you you'd love it. but then it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you'd love it, yeah. it's so love it freaking expensive to go overseas. Yeah. I mean, we're, we have three kids too. And, um, yeah, I told fair. my wife, like, we're not taking them cause I'm not pen- spending another 5,000 mm. on airfare. But, um, you know, a trip to Ireland, even for a couple people for a week or two is going to be like 10 grand. You know, it's like, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it, and Ireland is an expensive country now because we're doing well. <laughs> it's expensive heard, to stay here and eat here and live here. And, and all that kind of, it's, it's, it's an expensive country to my, live in. My now, parents which is, live next to a couple Irish people that moved here and they go back to visit and they're like, it's so friggin' expensive. We couldn't live yeah, there now. It is, yeah. It's just too much. Cause they got out. It is, it, they're going it's, back. So it's they said quite, we could even get a house. It's just yeah, crazy. It's quite expensive. You know, it is, it is good jobs means more money and that means inflation and everything's more expensive. Right. And, you know, it is. It's hard. All right, Sean, listen, I'm, I'm going to keep you for three hours if we don't get to these questions. That's okay. <laughs> I, 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 love, but, I love, I love chatting. All, all right. Good. Irish I, people chat. That's, that's, that's our thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, it, it's been great. I, so much good info. But um, let's get down to brass text here. Let me ask you one of the questions. Um, can you tell me about your first hot call you responded to? The first call that got your uh, adrenaline pumping? Yeah, I remember it really well. I was, um, this is kind of tied in with our uh, training uh, thing that I was talking about there. I was in my phase two, which was I 
had my blue epaulets on. I wasn't a full police officer. No still, numbers. But you're going, no numbers. You're just going around with the other cops. It, what the, the blue epaulet has like the college crest on it, you know, so, you know, so, you're a student. Yeah. yeah. The blue packs as they call us. But, uh, you, you, I was going out with the, we got a call in this place where I was doing this training. Um, that a guy was in his mother's front yard with a knife. And, uh, I remember thinking, wow, this is, uh, this is for real. Cool. Okay. This is, this is it. This is, this is, this is the real police stuff that I, I joined up to do. Sure. Um, and I was, I remember being excited, um, which is strange. Yeah. That's not a normal, probably human emotion to have when you're going to deal with a guy with a knife. And I should explain this as well. Um, is it probably a good time to explain it? What equipment Irish police officers carry? Yes, tell um, us. You, you know we're not armed uh, in general, um, but back then that was at a time in the late two thousands where there was a change occurring. Before two thousand and six, say that kind of a way, an Irish police officer went to work with a notebook, a thirteen inch wooden wood, baton. We, you call it a baton, I think, mm-hmm. in America, but yep. we call it a baton. Um, like 13 inches, not very long, made of wood, um, your notebook and your handcuffs. And you got a, a radio that was a Motorola VHF radio that didn't work for a mile outside the state. Once you got a mile outside the station, that didn't work. Yeah. And we were all, get, uh, police officers were using their own mobile phones to talk to each other because we didn't. Like, uh, this is just, I'm explaining this now because the sea change that has occurred in our equipment. Like, no vests. Really? Not even stab no, vests? No vests. Not even stab vests uh, back then, Jeez. no. Um, so there was like this that's modernizing thing that's happened. Yeah, it is. It was. Um, uh, the, like people that were performing certain duties, uh, armed members, could, there was like a pool issue of bulletproof vests, but there wasn't a uh, personal issue vests. So the big difference that happened was the end of the 2000s, someone kind of noticed, yeah, it's the 21st century. We got to do <laughs> something about yeah, this. Really? So, uh, it changed to, you had now, you got a utility belt. Um, you got an ASP 21, ASP 21 inch. Nice. Um, you got a, which people thought was really futuristic. It just, this, we, instead of this wooden, <laughs> yeah. this wooden crunch and we now have an extendable baton, you know, yeah. um, on a utility belt, which we never had before. Uh, your handcuff went in that pou- a pouch and the utility belt and your radio, you know, it's still the same old radio at Were the time. people like, no, you're militarizing our police. Oh, some people were. I bet. Uh, one of our, I think one of our senior officers at the time thought this was terrible. He wanted us to still be in, you know, your tunic as if it was 1958, kind of walking around yeah, in your, God which is, look, I think we all would love that, but yeah, um, if it was you need to safe. have PPE. Yeah, you need to have PPE. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you need to have personal protective equipment. That's just part of the job. Um, and I know there is a balance always in, in policing. Do you want to look tactical or do you want to look approachable? And I know right. that's a balance they have everywhere in the US as well, everywhere. But um, so, you, you know, you still had your shirt and tie and all that kind of thing. And, but you got a vest as well for the first time. Um, so it's an outer vest we wear, mm-hmm. um, which kind of ruins the whole shirt and tie thing. But anyway, um, right. so so that that day we were going, and you have a torch, which is great, obviously. Nice torches. We, we have uh, LED lenses, which are great torches, mm. torches I think. Um, so I was going to this call, and the thing is, when you are not attested, all those things are – like the baton is, is a weapon. The handcuffs are considered a weapon. Handcuffs are considered use of force as well course i don't know is it the same in the u.s but so as a student i'm not a police officer so i'm not entitled to any of those things excellent i have a vest and a torch in your sneakers see you later <laughs> no, I, I have a vest and a torch and and i have everything else. my uniform is the same i have my same bo- safety boots and all that kind of stuff that everyone else is wearing so i remember i was going there with a kind of experienced sergeant and uh he was just experienced and he was great really calm i was you know that's the thing when you go to one of these calls and the other officers that are there now, like I was by no means, I was not the lead officer. I, I wasn't a police officer technically. So I was there to assist or and they were telling me, you know, observe. They were saying, you know, stay back. But, you know, if you see some, if you can help, you know, don't. Yeah, don't let me and, get my uh, ass kicked by all means. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he, um, uh, you know, I had my vest on, I had my torch. Um, but they brought in a new LED lens that was shorter. You know, the old mag lights would have been longer kind of things mm-hmm. with this torch. Like a so, billy club as I'm itself. Saying, what I'm saying is the torch could be used as a weapon of last defense to defend myself if I needed to right. do that. And, 
I remember, I just remember the sergeant being so calm, so calm. You know, he was real. He's one of these guys. It's going to be all right. Don't worry about it. It's okay. It's fine. And now these officers just had their asps and their vests and they were going up to this thing. We subsequently got OC spray about two years later as well, which was a big thing again yeah. that we got OC spray, you know. Um, they kill us all. Which, yeah. And I know, I know from listening to you, you don't like OC. And yeah, it doesn't agree with You me. don't like spray. But it, it did, it was a game changer here because now guys, yeah, he's bigger than me and he's, uh, I'm just going to stand back here and spray him and wait for him to calm down there. But, yeah. you know, it, it really, it actually led to less people being hurt because do you want to wait on a guy with a, an asp or do you just want to spray him and it'll be gone in a half an hour? Well, I know whenever it's used, I always get a bit of it too. And two days later in the shower, you're still feeling it. I understand that. But, uh, it, does, yeah. it actually stops people getting injured a lot more. But, you know, anyway, mm-hmm. we went to this call. The sergeant was really calm and I said to him, um, I, I don't, what do I do? <laughs> you know, I don't, all I have is this little torch, you know? Yeah. And so he takes out this five cell mag light and hands it to me and said, yeah, yeah just in case you need it. Yeah. Here's a real flashlight. And we went, yeah, 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 yeah. So we go up and we kind of make a semicircle around this guy and he is, he's, he's, he's after taking something. I, I, I'm not sure. Probably the cocaine, massive cocaine problem in Ireland. Um, mm-hmm. Still is, and uh, I hate the stuff. It's just that's great for a bunch anyway. for a bunch of guys that like to drink and fight. You know, a little bit of cocaine in there too. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's I, I I think it's just terrible shit. But anyway, um, the it, it, this guy was opposite on something. I don't know what it was, and um, he was pacing over and back, and he had kind of like a meat cleaver. I remember it was a cleaver, which is weird instead of a knife. You know, you, you, everyone has knives in their ki- knives in their kitchen, but yeah. very few people have cleavers. Yeah, it was just a cartoon you know, with. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was like, and it, it looked sharp and everything. And I, I just, whatever, the, the sergeant kind of took the lead, which a good sergeant should do when he's on scene, you know? Sure. And uh, he was talking to this guy, and I remember he took out a cigarette, and he offered the guy a cigarette. And uh, this is real old school stuff, like, you know, yeah. it's really, really old school, you know? Um, particularly in the job I'm doing now, we deal with that a different way. <laughs> but... Uh, he, the guy came over and he was reaching for a, a cigarette and as he was the sergeant like and I don't know exactly how how he did it he knocked the knife out of the guy's uh, knocked the cleaver out of the guy's other hand and it came, fell on the floor and he nodded to me and I picked it up wow. and the guy was like frozen to the spot and the sergeant said to him are you taking taking the cigarette or what and he kind of took the cigarette and the sergeant listened for him. He said, are you coming with us, so or... And he came with us, and... That's amazing. It was, it was that's, some so... Je- that's some Jedi stuff right yeah, there. Yeah, it was so... Uh, it really, uh, it, it really um, emphasized for me earlier on. Now, you can't do that in every situation. It's just not possible. Oh, and he but, definitely put himself out there doing that. I mean, that was... He did, uh, but... Uh, I think being a good reader of a situation is important and you can't put yourself, like you don't know how the part, he, I don't know, he just read that situation so well. Mm. And back then at that time, the unit I'm in now didn't exist. There was no help coming. You were it. Right. So you had to deal with it some way. And it was potentially dangerous, but policing is inherently, it yeah. doesn't involve the risk. Isn't it? It's inherently dangerous, you know, did you take and, him to uh, the hospital or did you guys press charges? You, I, I believe, I believe he was brought in as a mental health patient. I believe mm, I, yeah. I, I, I was, as I, because I was a student at the time, I wasn't au fait to everything that was happening. I, I just remember thinking, Oh my God, this is cool. <laughs> what's, what's happening? You know, I was really, uh, I was really taken aback and impressed. And I thought, that, that I remember thinking, this is what I want to do. I mean, the whole situation was resolved. Nobody was hurt. The guy was a bit stunned, but nobody was hurt. Nobody was injured. Yeah. It all went well. And I, you know what? The whole thing felt safe. Whatever way that sergeant managed it, he had us all back far enough in a kind of a semicircle around the guy. There was a garden wall involved that was keeping a bit of distance as well. He, he just managed it really, really well. And I remember thinking, I want, to, I want, that's what I want to be. You know, oh, I want to be skills. like that. Yeah. Yeah. He just, he was really, really good at it. And, uh, I want, I want to, you know, and, and just, he wasn't being aggressive with the guy. He wasn't talking down to him. I think that's part of the reason why he read that situation so well and he was able to get him. But I do remember as, as for a hot call, I remember my heart was pounding. You know, this guy's oh. here with a meat cleaver. Yeah. I was like, this is, and I have a torch. <laughs> Sure. I remember thinking, I hope he doesn't get past everyone else and I'm, I'm the only one left here with heart, you know. But at the same time, I was like, there was no way I wasn't going there. Yeah. You know, um, but uh, yeah, 
that, 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 that really remember I, I remember thinking that this is what I want to do I think after that call you know That's I really remember cool. thinking that it's very cool you had the but, guy um, that sergeant like that to kind of um introduce yeah. you to a situation like that do you have you kept track of him at all is he still on the force yeah yeah I, I've met him again since yeah he was uh, he, he I he worked not too far from where I was working, and I meet him every so often. He was involved in the uh, public order unit, um, which I was a member of subsequently. Is um, that like the right like crew? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but that's um, a part-time unit that you get into. And it doesn't get used much in Ireland. We do, the riots don't <laughs> for all this stuff about us fighting and, and all that kind of riots don't happen here very often. So it's nice to have not a. It usually gets used or called up when like a dignitary is coming from abroad or something, and they need that kind of thing, you know? Gotcha. Yeah. That makes sense. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. And he was just, I don't know. I, I just, I, I remember the thinking that is a good way to deal with this situation. You know? I, I imagine Everyone it must've gets- been a little bit intimidating too. Where it's like, Oh my gosh, I have to have skills like this guy. It was like yeah, almost, I, uh, you know, unearthly. I, I don't know. It's probably like a, in a sports team or something. And you see a guy that you re, you know, you're impressed with and you want to be like that and that's how you want to do things and you okay. think that, that he handled analogy. that really yeah. well and he handled that really well and I got to try and learn from him and that, you know that's how I was thinking at the time you know I, I, I think um, really emphasized like it was all just it was impressive communication was the big thing with it you know and he, yeah. he read this guy really well he got him to talk him down a bit offered him the cigarette and then you know it was dealt with yeah. and nobody was hurt was that's great. cool you I know, love that I, story I really, that's really I really cool. I was really impressed at the time, you know. Sean, can yeah. you tell us about uh, a strange or bizarre thing you've dealt with? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, this is, you're going to get a laugh out of this. I, met, I was a police officer for a good few years at this stage and uh, got a call one day in the station and it was to the effect that there was a pig on the motorway. Now, the mo- motorway would be like a freeway, I suppose, in America. Oh, it's like a highway. Four like a big, lane. Big road. Yeah, four, four lanes with a center divider, a concrete center divider, you know, um, one way in each direction. You know, it's two lanes going each direction or whatever. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's dangerous working out there. And, he, you know, it's one of the most dangerous things you'll do as a police officer is work on that kind of road environment because mm-hmm. you will get killed. People will not see you and they will run you over. Especially by mistake, you know? over in the British Isles. I <laughs> heard they drive aggressive. Yeah, they can. And people just don't pay attention. You know, the, those kind of roads, because it's, you're just driving in one direction at 120 kilometers or 70 miles per hour, you just switch off and you don't see things, you know. And sometimes you have flashing lights on in the police car and people just tr- end up going closer. Yeah, like a mob. To, you just stare at them. You. It's like a mob of flame, yeah. What's going on there? Um, but I got, a, I got a call to say that there was a pig loose on the uh, motorway. And I remember thinking, I looked at the phone and I was like, is this person taking the piss? Or, you know, because they called the police station and said there's a pig loose in the motorway. I was like, and they told, you know, pigs mean the same thing in every, oh, <laughs> every country. Oh, yeah, I get you. Yeah. I was like, hang on, is this? <laughs> but the person sounded genuine. You know, they sounded right. genuine. And next thing my radio goes off. And by this stage, our radio systems have improved as well. We now have a digital radio system called Tetra. I don't know if anyone have Tetra in America. It's uh, like a Motorola radio, but it, it uses cells, cell towers. Yeah. Instead like, of, is, so you, it, is it like 800 megahertz, something like that? Something like it's, it's like, basically you get this thing and it's basically like a cell phone with a push to talk, but it's bigger than a cell like phone. Like a Nextel. It, 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 yeah. We have the same Kind ones. of, yeah. But it, it works everywhere. They have, they have it in the UK as well. It mm-hmm. just, there's a hundred percent coverage basically in the country. It's, we went from having... <laughs> No radio coverage to like 100%. That was a massive game yeah. changer. And, we have, I know, think we have the same radios. They're like $5,000 a piece, each portable. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's like a contract with a big company and I think they have to pay this company nearly like $1,000 a year for each radio. So, yeah, you know, huge it, money. But it, it, makes, it makes a big difference because it works everywhere and has a GPS in it. So if yes. it's a big red button and if you get in trouble, you and I've done this before, you press the big red button and then you start... This is where he is and he needs help and you get I to him. I did that anyway. a couple of weeks ago and they're like, uh, so somebody I work with called me and they're like, um, you got to, you, you got to respond to your radio because you hit that button. I'm like, oops. Yes. Ops are down People button. People do it by accident all the time. Yeah. 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 The big, big orange or red yep, button. That you exactly. Of, yeah. And we wear our radios up on our left shoulder. We don't put them on our belt. So it's, it's that the radio is that compact. It just goes up in your shoulder here. You know, you can talk into it there. Um, the entire radio, not just a mic, like, but, uh, the, the, as, as I was talking to this person on the phone, um, they, 
said to me, uh, he had his pig in the morning. And then my radio went off and it was the control room. And they said that there just there's reports coming in of um, a piglet, a loose piglet on the motorway. And I was like, okay, I suppose I'll go out and deal with that somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so I was in the car. I think I'm pretty sure I was in the car alone. And I went out there uh, in our patrol car and... Um, like our cars are we, we drive Hyundai's Hyundai kind of sedans I think you call them in the sedan like an estate we call mm-hmm. it but uh, and it cleared out the back because I had a feeling I was going to need the boot <laughs> for, for transporting whatever this animal was but I got out there and uh, all these cars were stopped with their uh, hazard lights on and I, I kind of weaved through the traffic and put on my blue lights and I got out put on my high vis jacket and here was a pig and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have to chase this little pig. It's a pig, like a you know, small pig. Yeah. I said, I'm going to have to chase oh, this thing, thing around, and people are going to put. I'm going to go up and inst. I'm going to go up on Instagram now. Oh like, yeah, absolutely. I it. would do that too if I saw that. I'd be like, <laughs> oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, yeah, yeah. Lena is so funny. I mean, I do it as well. And uh, just oh, this traffic. This is a main like motorways in Ireland are main routes between cities. You know, and so there was a lot of traffic backing up but people you know people with animals when they see an animal in distress people go into oh my god everyone stop everything we gotta sure. get this and um everybody look at this cop with this little I, brother I just, whatever it was with the pig. yeah yeah but uh i i remember the pig was really calm which i was surprised because i said he must be distressed you know be out in the motorway but he actually he was calm and I, he looked at me and i was able to walk up to him and just kind of i had a, an extra someone else's like uh waterproof high visibility jacket <laughs> Not mine. Yeah, yeah. And I wrapped the pig in that because, you know, I, I'm from the country. I know enough about pigs to know that they can be smelly. Um, so I wrapped him up in that and uh, I kind of put him in the boot of the car and I kind of surrounded him with, you know, our traffic stuff so he wouldn't move. Mm-hmm. I put him in a kind of a basket. You know, we have all like uh, Mepro lights. You know Mepro lights? Uh, mm-hmm. They're like uh, fla- uh, flashing be- beacons. Oh, yeah, like an like, accent or something instead of a flare. You could use yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have boxes with those in it and we had like... Uh, signs that we put up to say accident and mm-hmm. all that kind of so i kind of made a little bed for this pig in the middle of all this stuff and uh drove back to the station and then started scratching my head like what do i do with the pig yeah right <laughs> and every everyone thought this was hilarious we'd other officers coming from different places take pictures of the pig that we now had in the station you know was, we had to put him in a cell for a while then you know and give him some water and rang the local vet and said what do we do with this pig and they found a guy that was um he was like an organic pig farmer over there in the locality. And he uh, said, I'll take a free pig. I'll yeah, take free pig. Some bacon, why not? <laughs> yeah, sure. Brilliant. So I, I, I don't know what happened to the pig in the finish, but, um, you know, he, I, I like to think he lived a nice life in that little farm. Yeah. <laughs> However long it lasted after that. But that was my most bizarre thing was walking around this motorway, trying to cajole a pig to come with me in my police car. Oh my gosh! You must have been like, just let this be over. Let just let this pig. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I'm I'm really a a kind of a person, a a case or ass or I like you know, is what it is. Right. (laughs) I just got to deal with it now. There's nothing I can do. It's it's happening. (laughs) I'm probably going to be on Instagram. I don't know. I just just find the pig and get it into the car. So you guys actually, uh, you your the your bosses were cool with actually like having it in a cell and like giving it water and what that's the thing you're very um particularly in the countryside you're your own boss oh that's great you might not have a sergeant working on the shift so you have to decide what to do yourself a lot yeah, of the time that's like um, where i am right now particularly, i think this is yeah you're, uh, this is probably the weekends there was no one of a senior rank other than garda working. you're like i'll turn so, this place you know, into a farm i don't care yeah, 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 but you know, like we don't we do it with dogs all the time. They don't. In fairness, I don't. Our management never really have a problem with that. I mean, you know, it wasn't. It's not like that. We're that busy that we need the cells open all of the time. Uh, you know, it's particularly in a smaller town. You're you know, you're going to for prisoners coming in. You know, and we had yeah. two cells. They weren't going <laughs> to right. You weren't going to keep them full all the time. Which you one know? do you want uh, to go in so with the pig? I wasn't there for that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh... So yeah, I know that. It's it's we you know something like that happened now it would probably go up on the Garda Facebook page and be like yeah we yeah, found this little guy right anyone away. own him yeah, yeah and the, so um, I'd be like yeah does anyone know this guy that's kind we of a do big, with dogs all the time that's a kind of a big blind spot for country policing like where I am now it's you know we have an animal control officer but she's part time and is not always working or can always respond yeah, yeah. and you know there, there's 
going through the country, there's big roads that go other places and animals get hurt. And, you know, I just had a bear killed um, the other night, which was fascinating. I've never been this close to a, a black bear, you know, got smoked by a car. And yeah. um, they're like, yeah. in, like if a, if a domestic oh, yeah. animal gets injured, they don't really want us. It's strongly suggested that we don't destroy domestic animals. Like they don't want us shooting horses. Mm. They don't want shooting dogs and cats. Like wildlife, we shoot them all the time. But when it comes to domestic animals where it could be someone's property, they really don't want mm. police officers destroying them because it's not no. our property. I mean, and then it sucks because the animal's suffering. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it is. Uh, you can see where I suppose they're worrying how, how, where does this end with you know, liability and things like that afterwards. You exactly. Know. Like, we, oh, we, you murdered my dog. Well, it was going to die yeah, anyways. We, well, prove it. I'm we suing don't, you. Uh, we, we don't get involved in that at all. It's a vet. Oh, yeah. get a vet. So, but out in the country, there's no, there. like you get an injured dog yeah. or that's been half squished and it's like clearly nothing's going to help yeah, this dog. You got to, you need to, like I just start calling other, other four departments, you know, okay, can, can you, you know, what do I do with this? Can yeah. someone, can a vet, is there a country vet out here I could drive it to or... It sucks. I, I don't like it. I don't yeah. like injured, um, yeah, in, like injured pets like that. Everybody loves it. Well, uh, normal people love animals. Anyone who's in any way normal loves animals. Right. You, know, <laughs> you, you do. You don't want to see them suffering. You don't want to see them suffering. Like you know, um, uh, and it is. We we got used to get a lot of animal calls about you know stray dogs, and we kind of look after them because we. I'm sure it's the same with you, country policing. You are the only agency. That oh, does yeah, you have ten different hats out, out of our. You got to do everything, yeah, yeah. you know. And I, I, I actually used to like it. Got it can be stressful, but I didn't like it. If you're into, if you're a problem solving type of person, um, yeah. and people trust you enough to come to you with all of these issues, it's nice. Uh, I can see, like uh, you know, big city policing. Sometimes you can't do that because you just you're going from call to call to call. Um, country policing is um, more personable, maybe. I like it. I, I, I like it. I love it. I'll tell you right now, I love being a country cop. I think it's great. And, um, I've, where I'm working now, I've actually even got to know a bunch of community members and then later had an issue that had to be dealt with, with with like maybe a family member, but I knew the family Mm. and it, I don't know. I I just think it's a, it's a wonderful way to police and just go into the, the local store and, you know, getting a coffee and, and seeing everybody. And, um, I just think it's great. And I, I, it's, I'm also, going to be 42, you know? So it's not like I I've worked with guys who've worked out in this area where I am, who have already left. They're like, well, I'm going to the city because I need to go. Mm. I need like the, they wanted the action, you know, they wanted to go call. Yeah. Well, the thing, the thing about it is, uh, here, um, the problem with that is you do all the country policing and that's all, all the nice community policing side of things, but you also get the investigations. And after a while, that kind of workload builds up. Like I know, I don't know if you were saying in the U.S. that um, there might be another agency that might come in and take some of the other crimes. You know, the only the crime crimes. the other agency takes would be murder. So okay, all the other cases kind of, we yeah. handle, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I I did find sometimes the workload could get a lot, but it was enjoyable too. But you, when you're out in the country, it's kind of a it's a balancing act between you know you want to do all the kind of community policing stuff and you have to. But right. you also have all this leasing work you need to do, and there's uh, you need to look into the drug dealing down over here, and you need to, you know, sure. th- you need to deal with this theft or this burglary that ha- occurred and stuff like that. You can get, you can get a lot. The cool know? thing about the guard, I imagine, is you can slide to from the country to medium to to the city to you can. Yeah. I mean, it's you know, it's endless what you can do. We're not transferring departments; we're just transferring roles or stations right you know, that's awesome transferring yeah. different station, that's all yeah that's really cool yeah i would like to stay police in a, a lot of places in the u.s you know you could have a place in, in the city and then in the country yep you know absolutely the, so yeah next question can you tell us about your um most intense or terrifying call you dealt with yeah uh yeah the, it involved a guy with a shotgun um I was still uh, my uniform role at the time, and I believe it was a weekend. And I had, um, I, I was supposed to be finished, and I used to do this a lot: um, stay on unpaid overtime to get through some paperwork. You know, because I just had a lot of paperwork at the time, and I was like, "Yeah, I know I shouldn't be." It, that's the thing, a mistake you can make when you're younger. You can stay on it. You know. You, 
the paperwork will never end. It'll always be there and you need to draw a line at some stage and go home and just say, I need to go. When you, when you get older and you have a family or... Yeah, you just cut the line. You re- that I'm done. You realize there's, there is a line you have to go. I have to, yeah. I'm going home. This will be here tomorrow. It's fine. Um, and because I stayed on, the next unit had come on and it was a sergeant and a female um, colleague. And uh, I picked up the phone because it rang um you know, just give her a hand. She was dealing with someone at the hatch in the station, you know, because people come in here at stations for... Hatch like, would you be like the front passport. desk or like the public area? Yeah, yeah in the front desk. Yeah, exactly, in, in the public area. So if you're on station duties, you, you, you look after things like prisoners, the hatch in the public area. People have like passport forms they need to get signed. People have inquiries. People want to report crimes. It's an interesting place to be because you could be dealing. You could literally be dealing with anything uh, while you're at the in the public area. I don't know. Did, did in some place in the US it seems to be it's a specific duty to get that. Um, the public kind of. Oh yeah! If, if the place is big enough, they'll have a station officer that takes all walk-in. They call them walk-ins. Someone walks okay. in off the street. You meet them in a little interview room, and you take the report and. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well they, 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 in 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 Ireland, it, it would be um, you just you're rostered for that this day. Today you are the station orderly, so that's your job. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, um, and, and then tomorrow you are in the car. Today after you're on the beach, like walking or whatever, you know, depending on what the day is. Uh, but anyway, I was there. She was there. It was only herself, myself, and the sergeant. I wasn't meant to be there in a way. You know, I you staying late. Wasn't meant to be there, but staying late doing paperwork. And I pick up the phone and it was come here quickly. He's got to go on. I was like, oh boy, prank call, you know, prank call. <laughs> Does he have a piglet as well? Yeah. I was like, okay. And I could tell why the woman was terrified. So I was like, it isn't good. Yeah. It is not good. It's not so good. Clearly not all. a prank. No. Cause you know, when someone's terrified, mm-hmm. you know, the way someone the speaks, they're terrified. Yeah. Yeah. They just terrified. And, um, I, the sergeant that was there, he was a very experienced member, retired since, um, I said to him, look, serious, I'm over here for a sec. And um, she continued to tell me, just get here quick. He's got to go and he's pointing at me. I said, where are you? you know, these are the things you always try and get out of people. People want you there and you're like, what's happening? Where are you? Who, what, where, when, and why? Yeah. You know, that's what you're always trying to get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the most important thing as a police officer taking, if anyone's listening to this, this is becoming a police officer, <laughs> no matter where you are in the world. The five W's. No matter what's happening. Get the who, what, where, when, why. That's if you get that information, you can do a lot. Right. And even if you're a police officer and you're looking for assistance on the radio, and you, if you hot mic it and you shout all that out, then you can get the help. You know, that's what you need. That's the information a cop needs, I think, in my opinion, um, to get done what needs to be done. And uh, anyway, she, I got it out of her where where, where she was in the town, and. Uh, that it was her ex-husband and he had pulled a shotgun on her. She He, he called her over to the house, I, think, I believe, or something like that. And he pulled a shotgun on her, um, the Eda hunting shotgun. <clears throat> so I handed the phone over to the um, female member that was working, my colleague. And I said to her, look, I remember, I, I, this is the kind of calculation I made in my head. like, you have kids. I don't stay here. I'm going to go with the sergeant. Mm. Um, because it was, it was, it was nothing to do with her being a woman or anything like that. It was just sure. basic mathematics. She has kids. I don't No, it's nice. You know, we don't know what's, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, and I say, we had enough information to know where we were going. We knew we had a gun. We're getting on the radio looking for assistance and there just wasn't any armed assistance anywhere close. Um, but we were trying to get it on the way to us. But we knew we still had to, you still have to go, sure. you know, uh, because, and assess or contain the situation or get some oh idea what's goodness. going on. You don't have a gun yourself, so it's like, damn. No, no, no. Mm. Uh, I, I don't remember that being a... Uh, you're probably used to it, right? Yeah. I, when you're... A cop is a cop, whether you have a gun or not, and you know there's certain things you have to do. Of course. You, you need to establish where the situation is happening. You need to con- try and contain it to where it is. You need to try and extricate people if you can. You know, all this stuff is going on in your head. That's universal, you know. Sure. And um, so we get down to where the house is. And as we were leaving the station, I remember uh, the my female colleague shouting out the door at us. He's after shooting. 
because oh. she had heard this over the line, you know. And we were like, oh my God, we got to get to here quick. And I'm trying to think, what, what kind of shotgun is it? And I asked her, I said, quick, look up that address and on the computer system because, you know, if it's a registered firearm, it'll come up what kind of firearm it is. And But it was all so close. She was so close to the station. We were there very quickly. And uh, I remember just peering around the corner um, and thinking, uh, <laughs> you know, I was peering around the corner, but I remember putting my head down lower than my body height because I was thinking if he's going to shoot, shoot, shoot at me, he'll shoot at where he thinks I'm standing or, you know, right. something like that. And I remember that it was the lady who rang came out. She said, you took your time. And I was like, well, I got here as quick as I could. <laughs> you know, this is the fear that was in her of saying course. this. You know, she was completely. She wanted so you I, ran over, snap of a finger. I ran over to her. Yeah, I ran over. And we were there really quickly because it was just around the corner from the station. It wasn't very far. Um, and, you know, you're trying to get as much as yourself behind your vest as you possibly can. <laughs> But, you know, but you're running in and I ran in and I took her and I said, where is he? And he, she said, my son has him on the ground. So her son had been there, an adult son, and he'd rested him to the ground. Now, look, he, he had fired the gun at over her head. So, I mean, if he'd intended to kill her or do serious harm, he could have uh, there and then, you know. But uh, this was it, it was a mental health, basically, breakdown is what it came, came down to. Um and it was dealt with as that. But I just remember, I remember feeling that was probably, we were never not going to go. And we went, but I just, you know, that feeling of yep. fear that you have, but it's fear that you have to say, acknowledge it, park it, and then yep. go and do your job I know as best as you can. I know exactly what you're talking about, Sean. That's, I had a, I've had a call like that where it came in that it was an um, elderly male who was suicidal sitting at his kitchen table with the handgun and the health aid, home health aid was in there with him. Like couldn't leave. Oh yeah. And it's very similar. And then, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm approaching, trying to be tactical, trying to get her attention at the door. Um, same idea. Like I just, like, I felt like every part of me was exposed. Like I'm going to, you know, just yeah. not the face. Just don't shoot my face. Yeah, just, just not my beautiful face. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a similar thing where it, 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 it all de-escalated quickly and whatever, but it doesn't really matter when you get there and you're like, kakush, 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 and you're, yeah, yeah, and you're your just going, is, you're forward, you're going forward, yeah. you're, you're doing it. And you're finished and then you're like, why is my hand shaking? Yeah. <laughs> why, why is that happening? I always I tell I new, I always new officers that. I, said, I always say, you know, it's not, don't be caught off guard if, you, if you're afraid. I said, but the thing about being a police officer is you can be afraid, you still have to do it. You, you, you can't be afraid and then not go. You fear have, is a perfectly human emotion. Right. And that's it, where it, it, you can't be courageous without fear. So you have to, no. you have yeah. to do it. it. And then later yeah. you'll forget about it. But in the moment, yeah. like you said, you're when you're done, you're just, you're, all your major muscle groups are jumpy and like you get all that extra, you know, you can yeah. almost do a, a back handspring if you knew how, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I remember the group of people I was working with at the time, um, I trusted them a lot and we had each other's backs and we knew what we were doing and what well, we knew what we were doing. How do you ever know what you're doing? You see, you never know what you're doing in a situation like that, but you, right. you knew no one's going to do anything. No one was going to do anything rash. You trusted them. Or, yeah. yeah, we were going to do this as cautiously and as well as we could and try and do the best we could with what we had, which was much, but, um, especially a shotgun know. cause you don't even have to be a good shot. You know, the guy could just blast no, no, yeah, you. exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's just directional <laughs> over there, yonder, <laughs> yonder. Shoot, it sounds. Um, yeah, but uh, you know, that was. I do remember that was just. I remember thinking after, does that really just happen? I don't. But you know, it is. You just take a process it, move on, and um, it didn't uh, didn't stop stop it. Once I, I was just happy that I'd gone and done my job, and I was happy with that because that's all you want to be able to do, you know, go and do your job and then move on. Yeah, absolutely. You man. know, that's, that's a great one. Sean, can you tell us about, um, a positive encounter or a positive situation? Yeah. Well, that's the good thing about where I was country policing. As I said, uh, lots of things happen, but the most positive is going to sound counterintuitive. It, related to someone taking their own life um which is strange i suppose when you say it like that but basically this guy um 
he'd been troubled for a long time. He was an, uh, an adult uh, living at home with his parents, so he was in his thirties. His parents were older, you know, in the sixties, say. And uh, he'd been troubled for a while. We'd been up there a few times to his house, and uh, he'd gone to try and get help a few times, and it hadn't worked out. And he finally he took his own life very sadly. And um, mm. I remember we, we, it was around. It was wintertime anyway, it was dark. And myself and a buddy went up to the house and uh, the family were there and they were upset. They were, they were just really nice, gentle people, the parents, you know, really nice people. And that's how you realize like mental health is, uh, mental health problems are universal. It doesn't have to be uh, a troubled family background or yeah, it can true. be. And that makes it worse. Pop up. It, it can, you know, this guy had a really nice family and, and still you know the poor guy he just had his demons and he, he couldn't get work through them and so you're going to have like you have these possibilities as a police officer where you can do um you can do the things that others can't for the family say like the, the poor guy he, he, he was hanging from a ligature in in the hallway in the house and the parents just didn't know what to do they had no idea how to process this or deal with it or what they should do. And that's the good thing. I feel still in Ireland when people don't know what to do, they're in the police. They feel comfortable enough to do that with us, you know, and I, and uh, I'm quite proud of that in a way. So, you know, we got there and they just wanted to help. And so we, we were, unfortunately, and I'm sure you're the same, Steve, that as a police officer, you've seen a lot of that, a lot of, um, people taking their own lives you know that, that that happens a lot unfortunately so we knew what to do we were able to cut him down contact the coroner contact uh people to deal with uh, you know funeral undertakers sure. this family were um uh, you know they were practicing catholic so we got a priest and he was great as well I mean, i'm not a very religious person myself but i have massive respect for priests that come and deal with those kind of incidents too yeah our, ourselves in the pre we just sat and we kind of while all this was going on we sat with the parents and we had you know just tea we had tea with them and the, it was in, in their kitchen um and we tried to shield them from it as much and do as much of that for them as we could yeah while shielding them and just talking to them about their son and his life and what think positive things he'd done and that kind of thing you know Absolutely. and i just remember uh, so we dealt with that and unfortunately it, it, that wasn't the first uh, nor would it be the last person I dealt with in those kind of circumstances but uh, you know you, you moved on and I remember a couple of uh, weeks later I just got the most beautiful card from uh, you know a, a thank you card and a lovely handwritten letter from uh, this guy's parents uh, just thanking me and my colleague for what we did and that we took the time to you know walk them through the process and kind of just be kind with them you know because yeah. that's what they needed at that, at that time was someone to be kind with them and and i was really touched because you know uh, you do this a lot of the time and you don't expect um you know nobody you shouldn't do it for the kudos or for the back slapping but it was just nice that someone to despite all the the awful time that, that those parents were going through in their lives that they took time to write that letter to me and my colleague and uh, you know thank us for what we did and I really carry that with me afterwards whenever I was feeling down or I wasn't having a particularly good day or I was having a, a bad time with a member of the public. I remember the look that happened and there are really nice people out there and we are here to try and help them, you know? Yeah, isn't that nice? Doesn't that make a big difference getting something like it that? Does. Like a handwritten it, note? it really does. A handwritten really note. Does. A handwritten note is in the modern age of technology and email. and So personal. Uh, yeah, it really is. It really is. It's it's nice. It's, it really was nice. And I, I, I did... Um, I really, I really uh, was appreciative of that. That's lovely. I love that. The um, yeah. do you ever find when you're Sean, when you're at one of those situations, it's it's to me, it's still surreal. Like I just never get used to it. Like you're sitting there, and conversation will become normalized when you're kind of trying to console a family, and then they yeah. will inevitably revisit the moment of what's actually happening. Yeah, you know what I mean. You're able yeah. to pull them out for a little bit, and then they're like, "Oh my gosh!" And then they they have those relapses when they just, they do. Yeah. Oh my goodness, man. Those are so it, tough. It, it's probably something they should really address in like, please learn that on the job. And we do a bit of grief training, um, 
in the Gardaí, but uh, training and how to deal with people in those situations is probably, well, no, look, at the end of the day, you do have to learn most things on the job. Um, but it is important to be able to do that well because it is a massive part of your job, you know. Yeah. The police are going to tell you when these things happen, you know. Yes. I had my the, the, the first one I ever had was a, the first de- death notification I did was on an overnight shift, and the sergeant said, Hey, you got to come with me. You're going to do your first death notification. Yeah. No training, we, zero yeah, in yeah. academy about it. Yeah. And I'm petrified. Yeah. I'm more afraid to do this than a bunch of the other calls I'd already done. You know what I mean? Like, I was. Oh, but you're you're petrified. you're ruining someone's life. Yes, you know, it's yes. it's horrible. It, it really is. It, it's crazy. This know. this guy too. He said it was a Rhode Island State Trooper, and he said if you can manage, we'd love some medical records or dental records just to for yeah. positive ID. And I'm like, the sergeant told yeah. me that, and I'm like, so not only we tell him his 25 year old son is dead, it was so horrific that they want me to ask about a tattoo on his shoulder and about medical yeah. records. And yeah, he's like, awful. yeah, he said, if you can manage, I'm like, well, not, it's not, if you can manage, they need it. It's like they, they're asking yeah. us to do it, but they, but they feel so bad about it. <laughs> they're like, well, yeah, I know. Cause it's, 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 it's terrible. Like we are, and I would say we did get some training in, even back in the day um, when I trained with actors, Oh, really? like actors would come in and, yeah you had to go into a room with an actor and the important thing was you had to get the words out. That's interesting. You couldn't just say, I have some bad news about X, Y, or Z. You had to say your X, Y, Z is dead or your, you know, yeah. you know, you can't even say passed away or something like that. You have to be definitive mm. with them. <laughs> yeah. That's... And, you know, but it, it, it was good to do that, but it's still never going to, nothing is really going to, yeah, okay, it gives you some preparation, but nothing's going to really prepare you for going in and ruining someone's entire life to tell them that their son or daughter or husband right. or wife is dead. Like, you know, it's not, um, yeah, that's never, that's never going to be easy, but unfortunately it's something we have to do because who else is going to do it? Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And also, Obviously, that that particular time you made a big impact, so that's gotta you'll carry that with you to to the rest of your career. I'm sure. Yeah, I will. I really, I really, I was really touched uh, by that they took the time. Like they had, it was just awful what happened to them, and they still took the time to write a letter. They're just really classy, nice, lovely people, you know. And I was glad that I could do something for them in that moment of grief, you know. Absolutely, Sean. Here's this is the last question. It's a big one. The got a lot of people listening um, from all over the world, actually, that are getting into police work or actually are in academy now, um, and they want they want advice from seasoned officers. So, um, what could you impart on these on these rookies? Well, I don't know how seasoned I am. <laughs> I try my best. <laughs> well, I'd say thirteen um, years is plenty. Yeah, I um, I I was thinking about this, uh, and there's a couple of things. Um, I would say fitness is one thing and I don't just mean physical, which is important because you are going to get like, I, I've been talking a lot about communication and, um, and it is, it is the most important thing. Um, talking like verbal judo, like people talk, but that is the most sure. important thing. It really is. But sometimes you are going to have to physically restrain someone at some stage. It's going to happen. You cannot be a police officer anywhere in the world without having to do that someday. Yeah. And you're going to have to run after people. You're going to have to run. You're going to have to just do stuff, physical stuff. You you just have to do physical stuff. It's part right. of the job. And also, you work long hours. You work nights. You have uh, your eating habits are all over the place. So being fit is important. Be, your body being fit is important for all to keep keep you right with all that stuff. But it's also important to be mentally fit. And by that, I mean to have like support structures there for stuff. You're going to see terrible things. There's going to be organizational pressure on you. Um, lots of things are going to hap- <clears throat> happen that's going to, uh, that are going to affect your mental health. And to have you have a support structure, to have a, uh, you need to be comfortable talking to yourself and talking to other people, taking stock, um, like, if you have a partner or a parent or wife or a husband or someone that you can, someone who's in your corner that you can talk to, that you can bend their ear and get the stuff off your chest. 
I think that's important. And yes. a lot of the police telling stories is where we have this stuff pent up and you want to share it. Mm. To, it's like a, like a release valve. Sure. You know, and you want, you want someone to be able to talk to, so be comfortable talking about that kind of stuff. I think it's important because uh, I think you'll have a better career if you are comfortable. Don't just keep it up inside. Don't pent it up. Don't try and drink it away or that, that doesn't work. You know, it, it's going to come out eventually. Um, and if you need to talk to somebody professional, do that. Don't be afraid about doing that or don't be embarrassed about doing it or anything like that. That's important. You are just human. That's why the best police officers are humans with flaws and with fears and with all that kind of thing. And there's nothing weak about talking to someone about having issues. Of course. Um, the other big thing I think is... Um, Policing, and I, I know lots of people said this, like lots of people you know, on your podcast, Steve, people, the cliche thing is to say you join the police because you want to make a difference. You want to do this and that. And people say, uh, no, well, yeah, yeah, okay. But really you want to just be involved in car chases and you want to catch bad guys and all that. And sure. Yes, you do. That is part of what you're joining it is. But at the end of the day, once you're in a few years, you will realize, yes, car chases do happen. yes arresting bad guys does happen. Yes, you get in the odd scrap. Um, but actually, the majority of what you do is communication and problem solving. Yep. That is the vast, vast majority of what you do. True. And in the long, dark night of your career, being a good communicator and being a, a good problem solver will stand to you a lot. You know, that will stand to you. If you realize that's what the job is, and you're not uh, saying, I oh, thought this would be more car chases and stuff like that. That's not what society needs. They need that to happen sometimes. Right. But most of what they need from a police officer is they need someone that can solve problems. That's what we get called to, a problem, domestic. Uh, so true. A, you know, a family dispute, uh, two guys fighting outside a chip shop. Uh, you know, the, these are all problems that res- require communication. And sometimes, yes, you have to arrest people. But that, that shouldn't be your first uh, go-to thing. I know there's a thing, you know, when, when you're a hammer, every problem is a nail. But no, <laughs> right. you're, you're actually, you're not a hammer, you're a toolkit. You're, you're, you're everything. Yeah. And you need to realize, yes, arresting someone is one tool in that toolkit. But, you know, there's other things you can do as well. And, um, you know, I, I, I think there's, uh, I, uh, some people have said, Police are good at uh, giving you kudos for arrests you make and stops you make and tickets you give, um, but not so much, you know, the positive interactions you have with members of the public and stuff like that. You know, if we had a way of measure, you can't measure that in a metric. It's not a stat you they know. pull out. Yeah, no, it's not a stat. You can't do. You can't put that in a cop stat or cop stat or whatever the thing is called. You can't. You can't measure that. But that's actually in a country policing thing, particularly, and it should be in the cities more. Having those positive interactions with police are just as important as arresting bad guys and stuff as well. Because you know, I, I personally, I think, but uh, particularly even in the job I'm doing now, which is like a full time tactical job, mm-hmm. um, I'm still communicating with people mostly. That's still what you're doing. You're still going to these incidents. And it could, obviously, if we're going, it's a level of seriousness higher than your regular unarmed police officers here. But you're still hoping to resolve that with communication. Right. Rather than we have all the use of force options available to police officers from submachine guns to 40 millimeter launchers to taser to everything. But you want to resolve that without using anything, you know, you want yeah. to be able to go away from that incident and yeah, everything stayed in its holster. That's good. It's fantastic. It's all solved. Good, good job. Good day. That is, I think that really people need to realize that that's what policing, it isn't die hard. You know, it's not, that isn't what policing is, you know? Yeah. No, that's a great perspective, especially from a guy that's doing like a tactical job, like a, like a SWAT team, you know, that's, I don't think that's what people think uh, or people don't think that's how SWAT guys think. They probably think, oh, SWAT's here. They want to use their machine gun and they want yeah, to kick yeah. your door in. <laughs> they want to pull your, the SWAT, wall off your you house. Know, <laughs> all, I, I'm sure it's the same in America, but like, you know, SWAT or whoever, whatever tactical team, they're all police officers still. You've all been a cop. You've come right. from somewhere. And yes, you want to go in there and you want to deal. You want to go in there and deal with the issue. Right. But 
we're not crazy. We don't want to go in and shoot people. Uh, I think nobody I, wants to shoot anybody. I think it's great you, know? you have the background. You have all those years on before you became on a specialized unit like that. I think that's really valuable for, for that team, you know? Yeah. Like our training for that was, um, is extensive and it included a lot of negotiating, negotiating and, and that kind of thing as well. <clears throat> because you are the initial responder to the, you get called when someone's doing something with a weapon and you're right. the first responder. And of course you're going to, you are going to be the initial so the conversation goes, armed police, armed guardy, drop the weapon. No, I won't. Okay, well, we need to go somewhere from here. We need to <laughs> right. have a conversation. Well, that didn't work. We can't just, <laughs> yeah, well, oh, damn. Well, that one didn't work. So sometimes ahead. it does. Sometimes it does. Sometimes they see you rock up with all this stuff, and they're like, oh, they're not playing. Okay, that's fine. Right. And actually, sure. when I say sometimes, that happens a lot. Because right. especially in a country where the police are unarmed, when you see these guys come up and we have, uh, the unit that I'm in is... Um, like we have the best cars, we've all the equipment. We like we have uh, Audi Q7s. That's what we drive around in. Whereas oh, the normal sweet. police cars are he, the normal police cars are Hyundai. You know, right. so it, it is you see you come you get the Q7. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you you come in and you you know because it, well the reason we have those uh, is a kind of a tangent is it, we we cover kind of areas on a regional basis, so we cover a number of divisions. So you do a lot of driving, two calls, response driving. That's, cool. our, that's something I should have mentioned earlier. Our driving, um, uh, when you do the two years training, you're not trained in firearms or driving. During those two years, you do that afterwards. Oh, really? Interesting. Later on, um, as standalone courses to become a driver. Or, well, obviously, the firearms, then it's when you go into a unit that has firearms, you, you train in that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean. <laughs> You, you need to go, as I said, negotiating and talking and all that. It's very important. You need to go somewhere. You can't just say, I am telling you to do this, therefore you will do it. But should, right. the, the person, usually the person that um, is armed with some sort of weapon isn't exactly thinking clearly. <laughs> so, right. you know, he's not just going to make a logical choice. Uh, yeah, okay. Now, it makes he's, sense I, now that I heard you say it. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that now. And, then, yeah. and sometimes it does. Sometimes they do make a decision, you know, it, yeah, okay, these guys aren't playing. I'm going to drop this. But you want to try and not um, use these use of force. You, and you need to know when to and when not to. And we do lots of judgmental training and stuff like that to, to cover that. You know, when you know when to shoot, when not to shoot, when... Shoot, shoot no shoot scenarios, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And you, I know you're a firearms instructor, Steve, I'm sure. You, that, that goes on a lot in the US too. It's more... When everybody's armed, you have to, you know, that's really important. <laughs> right. You're going to every call with a firearm, you know. Right. Yeah, they always say I there's always going to be one gun. There's always going to be a gun at a call. At least one. Yes. Because you're, bring, gonna you're bringing it. You're, 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 you're bringing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And unfortunately, the last uh, member from Garda Shikana who was um, shot in the line of duty was shot with his own weapon. Oh, um, sucks. He was uh, like uh, the, the people other than us who are armed are detectives. All detectives are armed. Um, and it was just a kind of a mental health type call. A guy was just in the middle of the street and took his took his sidearm and killed him. Oh, it's terrible. Um, it was. It was really, really terrible. Uh you know, it was it was awful. Uh, we do we still do have police officers getting shot here. You know, even though not to the level of other places like the US, but it does happen. And in the last ten years, it's happened three times. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, it it does happen. Um. So it, it, that that kind of thing is a risk, and like you said, you bring your you 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 are bringing a gun to a call. So you do need to keep that in your mind all the time. Absolutely. Um, but I suppose here we can afford, you know, we, we do get a lot of training in my role because we are, that that is our job, our only job. Now, like if you're still a cop and if you see something on the street as you're passing, you have to deal with it. But in general, we're not getting sent to regular calls for service. We're dealing with they more probably, They things. probably don't want that. They probably don't want armed responses. No, they don't. Stuff. No, no. Because yeah. that's the thing. You, you, do, you want, do, do we need to be sending guns to this call? Why are we doing that? You know, you can make right. that decision. We we give them the luxury of making that decision, if that makes any sense. You know, sure. we don't have to be sending these guys to, because that's our only job, you know, and it's great. I mean, as a guy who's, you know. Yeah. Well, it's just a totally different uh, dynamic. So you show up to a barking dog call with a gun in Ireland. They're probably like, 
why is the arm response unit here? <laughs> it's like yes, sending the yeah, SWAT team exactly. to someone, you know. Yeah, it, 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 it is, it is, it is, it is, uh, it is, it, it, exactly. And it, the good thing is that you still have people coming up to you, like uh, if I'm getting a coffee in a in a service station, people will still come up and ask me for directions, which is great. Like, oh, know, that's cool. Sometimes they don't, even, they don't even register that you're armed. Yeah. You, you know, they don't even, they don't even, they just see Garda written on your vest and they're like, uh, and we dress differently. You know, the regular uniform here is still uh blue collared shirt and sure. slacks and a tie and all that kind of stuff. And we dress in tactical stuff, you know, like it's a wicking, a wicking shirt and yep. a, a play Over carrier and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and a taser on your chest and a sidearm on your hip. Yeah. See and where the say, vest uh, and all that. Yeah. And all that. And they're like, uh, just wondering where's the, um, where's <laughs> the, how is the best way to get to the castle? Uh, and you're right. like, Oh yeah, you're blah, 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 over there. That's great. Uh, I, 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 you know, it is, it is still good because that, that's people think uh, there, there's a policeman. I can ask him for directions. You know, that's, you know, they don't still feel standoffish yeah. with us and stuff. You know? What does Garda mean? Is that just a translation into Garda? Garda guard? is a translation of guard. Guard. Um, okay, so what, what on Garda Shikona means is the guardians of the peace. Oh, that's, that's awesome. That's badass. Yeah. 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 So it's guardians of the peace. That's, that's what the name literally translates as. That's what they're um, trying. Yeah. Part of the, thing going on in America right now is to try to take one of the like mantras I've heard was to, to, to make it make us more of guardians rather than warriors. Like that, that's like the, yeah, the, which makes sense. Cause you're guarding, you're the guardian of a community. You know, that's, that's kind of, that's what, what you are. Yeah, we've always had that kind of mantra or whatever that it's in our name and everything. You are not, um, you're, you're not, you're, you're not a war with the community or, Right, because a guardian is is certainly capable yeah. of being a warrior, but you're but exactly. you're more of a sheepdog than a. You know, a yeah, well, you're just trying to take care of people, and even the people that are doing the wrong stuff, you're still yeah yeah you have to arrest them and do all that, but you're not there to it's not a it's not like a a battle where you're you know this is the enemy right. I must destroy the enemy Ching. you know yeah yeah um you know you, you still have to deal with those people that way as well but you know right. But uh, yeah, Absolutely. I mean, if, if anyone's thinking about policing, and I know it's different in, it's a lot different in the US than it is here now. Um, I think it's different, but it's the same. Like I, it sounds, cause when I interview you, you guys from overseas, the calls sound so, and the people oh, sound yeah. so the same. You know, it's like, it's, it's, I think policing, yeah. like you said, it is the culture and everything around it can be totally different, but the, the yes. bones of it seem to be the what same. you're actually dealing with yes what, this is what i was trying to say that the problems people need you to solve for them <laughs> are the same yes everywhere in the world yep totally you are being called because something is happening that shouldn't be happening so you got a call to deal with it right you know and if that's the whole thing warrior guardian thing you're not coming they're not calling you to come in and you know, right. kicking a door and break stuff open, which you have to do sometimes right but it's knowing knowing when that is appropriate and knowing when you, talking is appropriate and knowing when you, that's the hard part. And I, I, I suppose that's what police training struggles to sure. teach. Like, you know, that sergeant I talked about in my first call, um, you just knew what to do there. Yeah. You know, it's hard to teach that. Yeah. It's it very is. hard to teach that, you know, but you, you should learn if you've good mentors and good people to look at. Um, maybe that's why I got into the role I'm in now. I saw him dealing with that, armed individual who's armed with a knife but uh, mm-hmm. so well I was like yeah, that's impressive yeah I've you heard know? that said before and common sense ever. is the biggest thing you want from police but oh, gotcha. but be aware common sense is not common not so don't common think you can just no. hire somebody to be a cop and they'll do it you need common sense but that's people take it for granted someone with a real yeah. level head on their shoulders not easy to find all the time you know for- but that's the thing where they're getting lost I think with a lot of the third level stuff um, yes, it is important for police officers to be educated like any, because it is an important job. It's as important as being a lawyer or a, a psychiatrist or a sociologist or any of those kind of jobs. And yes, yeah, you, you should have like a third level qualification as part of the training maybe or something. But having a degree going in and something else doesn't mean you're going to be a common sense individual that right. knows how yeah. to deal with people. Like a barman could be a very good police officer because they're used to dealing with people, right? You know, that I don't know. Did you ever work in a bar? I worked in a bar, Steve, before I was uh, when I was in college, and you I know, could you see, see you slinging all of drinks. humanity. You see all of humanity yes. in a bar, you know. Oh, totally. You just and you see them at their best and their worst. And yeah. you, I worked in bars too. I, I, yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. A, lot of, a lot of cops have because it's so, there is a transition, I think, there some way <laughs> to just being used to dealing with people when they're a little bit... Well, it's always good to meet your clientele before you start your profession. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing is actually uh, something... I, I'm sorry if I'm, I don't want to bother you with questions, but um, like, you know, in America, you, you, you're, you worked in your hometown, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, basically, I, it was one town over. Yeah, but it's it, close to... Yeah. You know, we, we cannot do that. There's actually a rule against it. It's not a bad rule. I cannot serve in my hometown. And I can see exactly why you don't want to be arresting people that you went to school with. Um, it's awkward. If at all possible. Yeah, I, I'd imagine it is. I and imagine it does, it's very it does, awkward. It makes, it, does make it, it makes it difficult to do, um, sometimes to do what really needs to be done. If you have a huge yes. history with somebody and you've known them and you knew when they were good and you know their personal life and, ah, oh, their dad died and this happened, it's not their fault. And, well, the, you know, now they're still a felon. Like they still have done. So it yeah. makes it that battle in your mind. That's, that's probably a good thing in a way that you saw. If you were just dealing with that person cold, you wouldn't, you see, you still have to do what you have to do. Right. But you probably came from it from a place of this is actually a person and not just a crook. That yeah. I have to it cuts both ways you know, for the, sure. Yeah. 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 Cause you know, if you just dealt with that person blind, you, ne- you, uh, you, you didn't know that they had a background and, their dad died or they, they, you know, there's a reason they are, there's a reason they are doing what they're doing now, you know? Oh, I mean, believe so, me, I had guys in the cell that would came right up to the cell and they're like, I want to, you know, Gould, Gould. And they come over and be like, yeah, what do you, you know, I, I grew up with them. And they're like, I just yeah. wanted, I want to let you know that you're an effing sellout. You know, that happened to me a bunch of times. And <laughs> yeah, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, like, how, how, how am I, I, I didn't just choke my, my I didn't choke my mom. That was you. How, yeah, yeah, how I am I a sell my job. Like, what am I, a musician that, yeah, that a, went big? There's a big thing here uh, with, uh, see, I don't know if you can, there's a great documentary that came out there just before COVID in Ireland, and it's on Virgin Media, which is a television channel here. It's called Inside the K. And it, I, I don't know, is it, is it like geo-locked for the US, but it's a great, it shows what inner city policing in Dublin in oh Ireland is gosh, like. Oh my I would now. love to see that. It's really good. Uh, it's really good. And the shootings ha- happening constantly, gangland stuff, you know. I heard Dublin's and, really bad. Uh, it, parts of it are, parts of it aren't. It's, it's, it's a modern European capital city. So right. it's like Boston. It's a major city, yeah. It's a major city. Stuff happens. Mm-hmm. That's life, you know. Boston, yeah, you wouldn't, you, you walk down Boston, it's ornate, it's beautiful. Yeah. If you talk to someone who, like I did who works in an ER there, like, oh, on the weekend, there's like seven to 10 shooting victims. I'm like, what? Yeah, yeah. In Boston? It's beautiful. What, what, where is this yeah. happening? They're like, well, not where you're going. It's happening yeah, you know, in the I, ghettos. I spend a lot of time in it. I spend a lot of time. I, like my wife has relatives in Boston. And we go over there a lot. It's lovely. I love, I love Boston. It's, more, it's the most European American yes. city. I, I say that all the time. The winding streets and stuff like that. Because, you know, it never burnt down. And it didn't right. have to rebuild it as like a, a grid. Exactly. <laughs> like they do with all the other cities, you oh, know. yeah. It sucks to drive um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I don't drive. I get the tea in and just like yep. park somewhere Beautiful outside and get city. a tea in. And, yeah, really nice. But it's, Dublin is the same. Beautiful. Really nice. And parts of it are rough, but that's the city. Cities it's are like humanity, that. brother. We can't escape it. That is it. That is it. You can't. You can't. It's no, going to happen. You know. Well, Sean. Exactly. I really appreciate you coming on the show, man. We're at almost two hours here. I really, oh, sorry. I, really appreciate- I, I didn't even know. No, I goes. feel bad. Sorry. I appreciate yeah, it, man. This yeah. was a lot of fun. No, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, it was really good talking to you. It, it feels like uh, I've been listening to you for so long. Um, I feel like I know you, you know, because you know, I'm listening to you talking to people and talking yes. all the time, and you know, I just talk easily. Absolutely. Hey, well, now you do. Now we're pals. So, yeah, that's it. Awesome, man. That's I, it, man. I truly appreciate it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you in the green room, do the outro, and we yeah. hang on the line for a sec. Sure. All right. Great. Hey guys, that was episode number 87 with the Irish police officer. What an interview. That was so much fun. I feel like I could have him back. I feel like we could talk for another two hours. I think what I feel like is I should convince my wife to let me go to Ireland on like a fact finding thing for the podcast, hang out with Sean in the Garda and party. I'll I'll have to talk to him afterwards. See if we can arrange that. Sean, can that happen? I can see him on the screen. Yes. (laughs) Guys, Thank you so much. Um, thank you for the continued support. Thank you for the reviews on iTunes. I, I know it's like a broken record. I say it all the time, but um, we're up over, I think, 540, over 540 reviews. And that really does help. It helps get eyes on the podcast. It helps me to get, um, you know, international guests like Sean to 
to find the podcast and and want to come on. So um, if you could do that, if that's the least, if the, if that's the only thing you do, I'm so appreciative. It's, it's awesome. If you want to be a sponsor or show your support, like if you love the podcast and you listen to all the episodes and, and you, you found value in it and entertainment and you thought it was great, uh, you can go to thingspleasesee.com. You can scroll down. You can click donate. You can sign up to be monthly or you can be um, a, a one-off. Any Anything you can do is is truly appreciated and or nothing at all. Just keep listening and appreciating because ultimately I'm, I, I want these guys and gals to, to share their stories with the world for people to hear what police actually do all over the world and just have an appreciation for it. Cause it's, it is freaking crazy. Absolutely. So, um, thank you guys, uh, for, for coming. Thank you for listening. And, um, Oh, I don't, I never plug this, but there, um, things please sees on Instagram and there's a Facebook group. So if you guys want to follow the show and, and interact with me, follow and, and go on and join the, uh, the Facebook page. And also if you want to be a guest, things, please um, scroll down, click, be a guest, if, or you can nominate somebody to be a guest. If you, if they haven't heard the show, but you think they would be good, you can do that. And, uh, I can get in contact with them. So, um, thank you guys. I love you. And, um, I'll see you next time. <laughs>